trends and prices and all that. Um, it's not really every day that we're going on the same day as the selection, so we keep you updated during the day. And we also often get the opportunity to get a lot of I've been informed today, so I'm absolutely thrilled to have Peter so great to me. His lifestyle and his fantastic hour with him about a week ago, musing about our mutual interests and I um, was incredibly inspired by his wisdom about how we can make a message about um, drug resistant infections and antimicrobial resistance at the user. So, a few words from Peter, and then I'm also very happy that Sharon's not here. Yeah. Also, highlight some of the opportunities that others have been together as we move forward. So, thank you. Good morning. It's pretty easy, pretty easy to get a Nobel laureate to the building we can't find it upstairs. It's better than the building. The building that's made up is that really good. I guess nobody's, I guess nobody's done, done it, so I should say it's uh, in the land of the water. It really can be people. And we acknowledge the people and the elders, elders and the national nation. And uh, uh, that consciousness should be, should be important to all of us, so Australians. Cultural heritage. We're only now going to be in It's great to be in this new building. It's great to share it. It's going to be a good place. And that's why Chad spent some time with me to bring me up to speed and make sure I didn't say anything to the and it was terrific to hear about because in this building, uh, which is really the concept of Jim McCluskey and Mike Clayton and a few people who got together a few years back, we brought together the whole of the infectious disease area in this part of Melbourne. And uh, we brought together an academic university department, but we also brought together more practical aspects of infectious disease with uh, literal and vids. And, uh, um, bacterial, bacterial diagnostics and so forth, so central to the type of uh, discussion we have today. The only area we don't actually have in the building is the veterinary microbiology. But what's happening here, particularly through this uh, initiative in, in uh, antimicrobial students, is that we're building a strong chasm and, and and various, various people have been building a strong bridge between the medical and the veterinary and the one health sense that, uh, that uh, we're, we're also keen on. My, my, uh, my, my tie is actually, I bought it at a very fancy tie shop, Sovatel in Amsterdam, where I was at the most recent One Health Beat. And as you can see, it's got orange and teal, so it's a very much tie. But the uh, One Health Meeting did be here in December. Uh, where, um, again, again, this idea across, across all species and, uh, and, uh, and all so this, areas. So this, this institute with 800 people in it is still sort of bedding down. Uh, not, not fully aware, fully aware of what's going on. We're all in different sort of groups and we come to different sorts of cultures. And it's terrific to see people coming together in this auditorium and starting to get across what the institute makes. So with that, with that, I'm going to uh, hand over to Sharon. So I'm going to give you the real. Thanks, Peter. And, uh, and uh, I also really acknowledge the time that I have been the land, where all the past and present, and welcome any indigenous uh, participants here today. Uh, uh, Peter's already given you a brief introduction of the Institute for those of those of you this is the first time, the first time that you have been here. Joey's enjoyed it. Uh, University, the University of Melbourne and Royal Melbourne Hospital, and we have been uh, up and running for two years, during in September 2014. Um, we have a major um, interest in antimicrobial resistance in all here associated with that job, which is one of the principal themes of what we do here. And I'm really delighted to see so many 
wants to contribute to the field as well as um, collaborate across, across the Victoria that are come up to be very, very important. And he'll be in the National Centre for Animal Progress. We want to start congratulating um, Kat and Chris for doing a really wonderful job in bringing all this stuff to the recovery and route together. I think, I think I need to tell you how important animal and protein resistance is and the interface between animal and human health in tackling that problem. But I think what's been really exciting over the last 12 months is that recognition globally of what an important issue this is. Um, it started, of course, with the WHO Global Action Plan on Antimicrobial Resistance. And, of course, Australia released its first national strategy on antimicrobial resistance. I think Probably for me, um, my, I've spent my career in um, HIV, but when I saw that the UN had a high level meeting on antimicrobial resistance in September of this year, I think that really drove home what an incredible opportunity this field now has to make a real impact. It's not often that the UN does this. Um, I believe the UN General Assembly has only done this four other times on a health issue. Um, one is in HIV. I actually had the opportunity to be at the most recent high-level meeting on ending AIDS that was in June of this year. In the HIV world, that has happened every five years. And although some people are quite cynical about that process, it is really, really powerful to get the whole world together to acknowledge that this is an important issue. It's also happened in non-communicable diseases and Ebola. So only uh, um, uh, three other times has the UN addressed an issue, a health issue. That's just how important it's now seen. I understand that at the high-level meeting, it brought together not only WHO, but the Food and Agricultural Organisations of the United Nations and the World Organisation for Animal Health. So I think that really sets the scene for what um, NCAS can do. Incredible timing that NCAS has just started up now with a very similar vision to what I think the rest of the world is speaking about in how you can link animal health and human health um, to address the problems of antimicrobial resistance. As Peter mentioned, um, the Doherty has a really significant critical mass of um, people that have the skills that can tackle this problem, uh, ranging from basic science and discovery research, applied public health and genomics, um, clinical care and epidemiology. But I'm really delighted that um, we, of course, can't do this sort of work alone and that through NCAS, um, we've reached out to many other critical um, and important collaborators as part of this effort, including Faculty of Veterinary and Agricultural Science here at the University of Melbourne, Department of General Practice and Infectious Diseases at Monash, Barwon Health and other um, important partners. So um, I'm really looking forward to seeing what um, NCAS will deliver over the next five years, not just being a forum for collaborative research, but a fantastic avenue for training um, people with the skills that are required to tackle antimicrobial resistance. It's fantastic already that there is such a large uh, multidisciplinary team with people doing PhDs or pharmacists, nurse, public health background, and hopefully we'll welcome um, many more to the team. So hopefully I wish you um, a really productive uh, first annual forum, and I look forward to hearing about many of the successes that will come from NCAS. So welcome again. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sharon, and, and welcome again to everybody. Um, I guess just some brief housekeeping before we start. The toilets are at the back end. Um, we'll be having morning tea and lunch in this area. For those of you who want to break out or meet together, I've also booked out the seminar room just up on the mezzanine um, so that you can go up there, particularly at lunchtime. I think the animal people might come out to um, catch up and um, chat. Um, I'm Kaz Bursky, I'm an ID physician and I've been working in the Earth Stewardship for about probably 15 to 20 years, very closely with Kirsty of course, and we had a partnership grant before this and, and this area was very exciting and the most exciting thing for me actually personally has been to start working with the animal people who've been amazing group, um, but also to, to have the opportunity to start really linking up with some of the other fantastic groups and before I, before I start my talk I did want to introduce mentioned that the Centre for Research Excellence is 
um, we have got a number of um, people from other CREs around the country, which are very important to us, particularly the Bond University um, group of evidence-based practices. Well, bless you. Um, Nick Graves, um, David Patterson is producing health, um, in, uh, health groups that with infections. Um, Jason Robertson's a new CRE, which is going to be based around PKPD. And then even our local new CRE, um, uh, which Sharon's leading, which is the um, Emerging um, Response um, Network for Infectious Diseases. And then Jenny McBurney here, who's also going to modelling. So, we actually really believe it's important for us to not do solo work here and to really start to work together to, to move this um, move this along. So what I'll do is, and just a quick hello to all our people online. So I think we've got about 40 people this year with about 100 registered. So we will be taking questions through um, go to and just to remind you, we do ask questions to use the microphone so that the webinar people can pick it up. Okay, um, so my role today was to sort of give you a broader brush about where we're sitting nationally and today I'll cover off some of the aims that we have as a centre, some of the national and international um, events that are driving this sense of urgency that we have now and some of the particular challenges that we're facing um, in dealing with the data and emerging data that we're required to, to process and come back with feedback and reports and national reports. It'll be, uh, it's going to be fantastic to hear about the issues around animal use. Um, Ben's going to be talking about laboratory challenges with um, drug resistant infections. Um, Leon has a fantastic um, talk particularly about the issues around effective data linkage. Um, and Kirsty was going to finish up the morning with I guess the um, demonstrating to you some of the very great opportunities that we have both nationally and internationally. After lunch, we'll be updating you with some of the work from each of our streams. So we have um, several streams and within those talks is actually new data that we've actually um, put together from our MAPS um, audits that will be presented as well as some very exciting opportunities. So as Sharon mentioned, we are a collaborative centre and there's much work that's already been done and I particularly want to mention um, our group um, at Royal Melbourne, VIDS, which is a guidance team where we really have a very strong team of about 18 people now working with information technology, development, decision support and the MAPS program and it's a wonderful team that's going to support this CRE going forward. Um, Daniel Matzer is online. She's a um, general practice at Monash University. We have Glenn and his team at um, University of Melbourne. We have Yvette Bono, one of our um, AI down from the Clinical Ethical Commission, who's here at Harvey Lander, also very strong um, collaborators, particularly in the area of sepsis. Um, we have Vickness, who really um, have been a fantastic team to work with because they have a central role with their incredible experience in um, data, data management, reporting, feedback and benchmarking across the fine infections. And then of course our new groups of the Doty, which are new opportunities for us um, and we've already done some preliminary meetings with Jody, the other epidemiologists, to start to look at um, particularly with data. We are actually very well supported by the Commission with our MAPS work and the Commission, um, Fiona Godson's down here today, uh, they've been very important for us and they've contributed to and supported our national um, reports that we've published, particularly in the area of aged care prescribing and on some hospital prescribing. So I guess one thing, 
which has become apparent to us as we move through our research is this concept of health services research. Many of you will have come from backgrounds with public health or uh, clinical research or basic research and health services is something very exciting because it means that we can actually change practice as we do our research. We have already created a change in policy and practice simply on the back of some of the work that we've done. Our pilot aged care survey led to interest quickly from the Commission and, and um, the Commonwealth. Um, they realised, well, we don't actually have effective accreditation guidelines for aged care facilities and, and that work has already started. Similar with the surgical prophylaxis, again, that has triggered interest in a new working party that's supported by the College of Surgeons, realising that there's a major issue. So we are in a very agile environment and the aim is that we can quickly change, quickly move on knowledge that we generate. Um, and it's hope, hopefully with the other CREs around we can all work together. <coughs> so the NCAS is really focusing on trying to understand how much and why antibiotics are used, not only what is appropriate, but also trying to understand where there is inappropriate use. Clearly elucidated in the hospital prescribing, perhaps less clear in other sectors, um, in aged care, surgical, surgical and animal prescribing. We need to understand the drivers and knowledge and attitudes, and this is where some of the other methodologies come in, the qualitative methodologies of research, which as an ID physician have been very new, but are very exciting and actually very important. And for any of those who um, track some of this literature, there are some fantastic qualitative research in Philadelphia, Fashion and Aiton, and also Alex Broom um, from Queensland, who are really starting to publish some very interesting papers about why it's so hard to get stewardship up in, in your institution, for example. Moving on from that, there are some areas where we can move quickly to interventions, and we talk about um, hospital stewardship is probably fairly advanced, and others are less advanced, but it is actually important to understand if you are going to do an intervention, how does it contextually fit with the workflow? And in fact, is it acceptable? Does it work? Um, and it ultimately, is it sustainable? And our goal has been to ensure that our PhDs and postdocs work across all the streams and share some of the learning. And, and um, this has already been um, demonstrated in, in a number of instances where we've had these amazing meetings where the animal animal PhDs chatting to the rural regional and the aged care. It's really terrific. So the real sense of urgency came with the identification of the NCR1 um, resistance gene, which was found um, by, I guess they were looking at doing some genome-wide genome sampling of, of E. coli isolates. And this triggered enormous concern. It conferred high-level cholesterol resistance, it's now plasmid-based, so quickly transmissible. And because of this real push in genomics, all these other labs went out and looked at all the isolates, and lo and behold, it was apparent that this isolate was not only found in animal surveillance isolates in several countries in Europe and Asia, but it had also been identified in a couple of patients. Um, this actually triggered Great, grave concern. We do not use colistamina and animal fraction in Australia, and, and as far as we know, NCR1 has not been found in any Australian isolates. But this is really the trigger to call for worldwide bans on um, antibiotics in, as growth promoters using colistin, and countries with very high usage were countries like Spain and China, extraordinary high levels of colistin use. And at the same time, because it was clearly something that came out of animals, for the first time we really start to see this one health thing, this one health concept being thrown around. It's a direct, it was a direct threat to, to human health. And I think this is really the start of what's happened. So what you saw were these headline articles that I'm sure you've seen. Um, the superbug, you know, the end of the world as we know it. And um, national strategy plans were put together. So some Greece, I'm not sure if you're aware, but Greece and um, Malta are sort of the epicenter of highly resistant gram negative. So it's good to see that they've had an AMR strategy for a while. I'm not sure how well they're going. But um, Denmark, France um, and Europe, Australia was um, June 2015. Then we have 
WHO Global Action Plan. They had a couple of iterations of action plans over the year, over the years, and then the O'Neill report, which I'll cover shortly, really was something that was presented very widely. Um, the Aura report, as you know, um, was due in 2016, and then, as Sharon mentioned, the United Nations draft report in September. The O'Neill report is an interesting one. It was actually done, commissioned by Dame Sally Davis, and it's done by a health economist. And it really pictures this issue in sort of a, a health economic framework, and it's been very widely reported <coughs> to the G20 UN meetings, and it really called for a health, not health, health economic approach to solving the problem, particularly setting priorities for new drug development and new diagnostics, and, and huge market entry rewards of a billion dollars for developing new antibody to come to the market and to ensure that there's accessibility of antimicrobials to all nations. There's a short section at the end of that information ideas. It doesn't talk about effectively using current antibiotics effectively particularly and the word stewardship is mentioned 23 times throughout the document despite there was a glossary of some of the other terms. Stewardship was never defined. And so this is now leading to some interesting um, comments in, in papers and newspapers about well, what does that mean, how do we implement this um, new report. So this was the type of publication that we saw. This was out of the Irish newspaper talking about superbugs being a bigger risk, than ca bigger risk than cancer. It's hard to know what it means and it doesn't really help us for those of us who are on the ground having to do something about it. This, the UN draft declaration is a very good document and it's worthwhile reading through it. I think there's about 16 different points. But I picked out one that I thought was actually really good. It was, it was really saying that we acknowledge that there is resistance and that, it, that they're becoming less effective and it's actually due to inappropriate use. So this word inappropriate use is something that's very important to us in stewardship. So rather than presenting volumes of antibiotics and DVDs and the sort of publication, particularly the US, have been putting out over the years and volume of years, it's not very helpful. We actually need to know what's appropriate and what's inappropriate. Um, lack of access to health services is clearly important and um, effective laboratory and diagnostic capacity. And then bringing in some of the other one health issues like antimicrobial residues. Um, the plan from this <coughs> recommendation is that the WHO and the World Organisation for Animal Health and the UN form this huge inter-global agency and the suggestion is that the WHO is probably the best organisation to lead it, but then what next? Um, what next? <laughs> so that's where we come in. And implementation is very hard. It's very hard because you need to tailor it for local um, resources and local expertise and the local circumstances. The Australia's national strategy um, I really like because it's one of the few national strategies that actually includes the words implement effective. It doesn't just say um, stewardship is important, it's that effective implementation. I think that's a really important inclusion there. If we look at the situation with um, Countries around the world, the WHO put out a report, I think it was there in 2015, which really was a snapshot to see what um, crisis there was from the top level down in some of their regions around the world um, with regards to having national strategies, for example, and not surprisingly, Africa, um, the Americas, East Mediterranean, the Western Pacific, really very early on in terms of trying to get that top-down structure to actually move forward with implementing some sort of strategy. And that's actually very relevant. We um, had the opportunity to do some in-country visits to some Pacific countries this year. We went to uh, Asia Pacific, we went to Mongolia, Philippines, Laos and Vietnam to actually review how they're doing the stewardship in the hospitals. Australia it is internationally recognised with regards to some of its quality safety initiatives and when you do travel overseas, you realise how good we have it in our hospitals anyway. We have one of the few countries, I think possibly 
one of, one of the few countries that actually has a hospital-wide accreditation program that is a standalone criterion um, that's been in place for a good couple of years now. We're one of the few countries that actually has a national guidelines, a very good guideline group, some of you are here today. We have a very strong um, clinical pharmacy standard with quality of medicine centres in hospitals. Um, even in the private sector, you're really starting to see this strong clinical focus. We have a national observation chart and a national <coughs> compassion drug chart. These are huge achievements which can't be underestimated when you go overseas and see what we're using. Um, high quality infection prevention and medical care. And actually, really, we have pretty low rates of resistance. And some of the things like MSA are declining. We have other things like PRE, which we're international leaders on. And we also have um, strategies in place getting some reasonable data that we can use. If you compare that to the developing nations, their concept of accreditation is kind of licensing. So that you do something, that they visit and a, and a tick box. There's no real quality and safety focus on accreditation. They don't have um, guidelines localised to their needs. Um, they have very, very few clinical pharmacies. And as opposed to Australia with very high levels of infection prevention and medical care, in developing countries, antibiotics are actually essential because it is actually sometimes a substitute for the fact that there's just no sanitation, hygiene or access to care. And the clinical pharmacy issue is a very serious one. It's not a, it's very unusual in Asia to have a, have a dedicated clinical pharmacist doing clinical work. And of course, it's compounded by the over-the-counter antibiotics um, and poor laboratory and surveillance support. So many of these publications, very high levels of resistance, um, are hard to interpret because A, not very many people get um, microbiology, but if it is, they're very sick people, so it's very biased, this whole sort of data that's been used to drive their own clinical guidelines. In Australia, we've had um, accreditation in place now, which is fairly, um, I guess, open to interpretation by hospitals, but it's been there and it's been a big driver for hospitals to take it on because it had to do it, which is always important. Um, and the proposed um, update is on its way. It's in draft standard. You can see that it's started to become a little bit more granular because we've had much more experience. And it's bringing in concepts like our um, stewardship clinical care standard, which rather than being a requirement for hospitals to meet, it means how the prescriber must prescribe. So if you are going to prescribe an antibiotic, you need to explain to the patient that hey, this is why you're using this antibiotic. These are the side effects. These are negative. These are how you need to take it. The patient needs to, you know, they need to demonstrate that they understand why. And it's starting to bring that person level um, stewardship in place. We're also working hard. Our, the Commission AMS working group to update our book. This was the book published in 2011. Very popular and actually used by many of our international colleagues to help set up the antimicrobial stewardship um, committees. And uh, the, the new book is very exciting because it really drills down some of the areas and also brings into play some important roles which haven't been um, perhaps um, maximised. And, and nurses are a particular one where we're very interested in starting to bring the people at the face of care. It's also really the, the Aboriginal health chat, chapter and paediatric chapters. These are really important areas of stewardship that have been seen to be left behind. Which, um, and so this is, um, I think, the owners in the audience, I think she's pretty, there's also going to be a sensitive editorial meeting about it, but um, hopefully early 2007. I'm not going to cover this a lot because Leon will cover it very well, but there is a real issue about understanding how usage impacts on resistance and how the interplay between <coughs> community and hospital, the, the land and animals, how does it all work? And it is fair to say that we don't actually really know still. And particularly in Australia, there are serious issues with actually having effective data linkages between surveillance and usage and resistance. And I think this is particularly something we need to work on. Our colleagues at the Imperial College of London have done some fantastic work modelling resistance moving in and out of community and hospitals because they have the NHS and they have this data from community and hospitals. We still don't have it. 
And despite the fact that we're relatively advanced in stewardship, we're still quite behind in some of these technological issues. The other important point I wanted to make is when we do, if we are assuming stewardship is going to be a reduction or trying to reduce in and both use in total, but it's also about appropriate use, we need to think about measuring the intended and unintended consequences. And I've got a couple of examples which I highlight. The first one was a Scottish 4C program where they decided that they um, really stopped using things starting with C, Kepler's boron, Cipro, um, or what we would call Menton, Quinda, and they did some review of patient outcomes in surgery and identified that there was, some, there was a spike in acute kidney injury relating to the change in surgical prophylaxis guidelines and had to reconsider. This was one of the first sort of realisations, well, we need to be careful what we're doing. We had a visiting um, expert in stewardship, Harkin Hamburger, last year from Sweden, who talked about the incredibly low rates of our antibiotic use. In fact, it's so low that they were starting to get worried we were missing you know, patients who really need antibiotics not being treated. And so they had looked closely and hadn't seen any signals in terms of increase on mastoidina, for example. But he, anecdotally, he was saying our ENT surgeons are a bit worried about whether there's a rise in retrovarital abscess and we need to keep an eye out on our client for it. The paediatric, there was a recent match case control multi-centre study which showed that children with viral illnesses were treated with non steroidal rather than antibiotics at a higher rate of impact. That's new data, it's very interesting. And for those of us who throw neurofilm around with our kids, it sort of makes you really think twice. And then with the move to shorter course therapies, um, both in adults and in paediatrics, um, I think we do need to think about are there any unintended consequences in particular patient groups and perhaps not picked up in the, in the clinical trial data. For guidance, we have been in um, 60 hospitals now and our guidance group in Victoria wanted to look to see well, what impact has it had in our state in the nine large hospitals that we've been in. Um, they, the system had been implemented over a number of years and most hospitals had a baseline period, a period when the guidance electronic approval system was in place and then variable intro, in, introduction of post prescription review or what we call antimicrobial rounds. And we could see that those hospitals with guidance in place had much higher rates of appropriateness on the MAP survey and that there was an impact on, on broad, use of broad spectrum antimicrobials and particularly some important classes which I think all of us see when we start to shoot stewardship, third generation Kepler's forms and lizard mice and respiratory tract infections are a major driver of our antimicrobial use in hospitals so it's not surprising once you put stewardship in place that they start to reduce. reduce. But what we really wanted to look at was well, has our system impacted on patient outcomes? And what we found was in, um, from the data on gram negative sepsis, because we assume that a patient with a gram negative bacteria should be treated, that um, we really started to see a, a mortality benefit once you put the post prescription review in place with the system. The community quite pneumonia, pneumonia emissions, um, as soon as you put the system in place, there was a, a um, shortening, shortening in length of stay, um, which was even better once you put the post description review in. It's really an illustration of how we need to try and use that data to actually demonstrate better patient outcomes. Information technology is something we're particularly passionate about and we've spent the last year meeting and talking with many of our colleagues around the country and it's the same message from everybody. We just don't have time to collect all the data for our courts. We really need to get aggregated data. We need to have useful alerts that can support our program and we need really good decision support. And I would say it's the same for general practices in hospitals actually. GPs need the same level of support for their own personal practice to know well, how am I going and where, how do I get to the guidelines, etc. Stewardship is very tricky. It's not all or none. It requires a so, what I call a socio-technological solution because different people do different things and it really is part of how we do our workflow and the solution that we need needs to fit that kind of workflow whether we're in a rural regional hospital versus a big, massive 
quaternary centre where we're dealing with really complicated patients where a whole lot of people are doing it. And it's about having a system that supports it. Many of our systems in hospitals are very patient-centred. The electronic health records and electronic medication management systems are patient-centred. They're about finding about, about the data about that patient. It's not, it, they're not fit for purpose for a system-wide system -wide program like stewardship. And so in the States and Europe and probably in Australia, we are going to require third-party tools to support that process. And there are many examples of infection prevention software that support it. Um, in Australia, we have our approval systems. Everyone talks about mobile apps. They're still early phase, and they don't really influence prescribers at the point of care. Um, and general practice, we know that many of the, um, there aren't very many prescribing systems out there, but it's still very hard to get influence about decision making at the time of point of care. So our role with NCAS, I hope, is to actually help with this interoperability with these systems. We are, we are committed within Melbourne Health, in fact the Melbourne Health Board have invested in our team so that we can stay agnostic and we can support um, all, all sectors with our, with our information technology. Last couple of slides, this is my seriously my favourite topic at the moment and as those of you who watch TED watch it, so this is about the microbiome, how important our microbiome is and how it's probably going to be the next big thing for us ID physicians and stewardship physicians. It's this concept that our microbiome is like a human organ. We have thousands of prokaryotes in our gut and that appears to be very closely aligned to how the immune system develops, it matures by the age of five. Um, it can be definitely impacted by these sorts of things, both utero and immediately postnatal. Um, and it appears that you need to retain a biodiversity in the gut because that influences um, the development of immune diseases later. There's also conflicting reports about antibiotic exposure to children and whether or not it causes obesity. These things are powerful messages once that gets out to the public that if you're giving your baby unnecessary moxy for an infection, they're going to end up with obesity later. We need to know what, what, what the real story is. And again, um, some more evidence coming through about how gut disruption by exposure to high-risk antibiotics, broad-spectrum antibiotics can actually predispose you to sepsis and acute respiratory distress syndrome later on. They, another, um, nature microbiology is full of this stuff and this concept culture romics where you actually deep dive into the gut, not just using metagenomics but culture romics, using 16S, um, using multiple culture and multi-top to really identify, they've been able to double the number of bacteria that they've um, identified in the human gut and, and we need to understand what particular bacteria do if we're going to talk about the role of antibiotics and gut manipulation and, and how that's going to impact our patient care. So um, the, this Logan um, review is a really nice one that sort of covers off the kind of general consensus. I just want to finish up with a couple of slides about the language and I think this is a very powerful piece of work by the Wellcome Trust. It is a truly fantastic qualitative study where they've done peer and family interviews and paired interviews to try to drill down and understand what people um, know or think of antimicrobial resistance. And it was fairly clear that lots of people have heard about antibiotic resistance, about half understand it, but then when you say, well, what, what do you mean? It's, it's this sort of misconception that it's actually the body becoming resistant to the antibody. And these terms that we hear in the media Super bad. It's lost. There's lots of great sort of comments throughout the report about, oh, we're just sick of hearing the word super bad. It doesn't mean anything. What does it mean anyway? Um, and people are sick of hearing this kind of sensationalist reporting, and it needs to focus right down. And we talk about E. coli or Salmonella or something that means something to someone. An E. coli UTI, you know, something that actually can, people can identify with. They don't understand the term antimicrobial resistance and need to move away from the sensationalist cost and death type reporting. And so their recommendations are really to move away from these terms that we're using and call them drug resistant infections or antibiotic resistant infections, to move away from these sort of, there's going to be X number of deaths by 2050, 
to very specific discussions about specific drugs, specific infections, and I hope all of you can think about that when you're putting together patient information or other sorts of pieces of work. We've been busy this year. We're contri contributing as a, the active surveillance arm with Aura, with our maps. We've had several international presentations, <coughs> hosts and presentations at a number of international conferences. We have a great journal club every month. It's a webinar. We have lots of people dialing in, and um, we have the, all our streams presenting. That's a picture of Sonia doing an online training for our um, NAPS program and helping people all around the country undertake their surveys. We had our first um, confirmation with um, Leslie from Aged Care. It was fantastic, all the, everyone was there, the animal people sitting in the room. Um, we published the first ever Aged Care Point Prevalence Survey. Um, Kirsty's working with Ben um, with the CPR <coughs> outbreak and working together to develop clinical guidelines about how to manage it. Um, Laura, our um, animal PhD, um, did a fantastic job again with everyone in the room from all the different streams with her, her PhD confirmation a few weeks ago. And finally, our visit to um, Angel was really very eye-opening. And I guess my last slide is our Twitter feed, which I really enjoy doing. We have about, last count, 705, and we have all sorts of people, British Society of Vets, all sorts of people, very um, senior groups around the world. And we'll be doing the Twitter feed as part of um, our Antimicrobial Awareness Week in that week of November the 18th. But if you, if you haven't thought about Twitter, please join. It's a fantastic way to keep up to date with the very wide literature. So I might stop there. Now, we have Glenn Brownwood. Thanks very much, Kaz. Um, it's a pleasure to be here talking to such a wide-ranging audience today. Um, my name is Glenn Browning, and I'm in the Faculty of Veterinary and Agricultural Scientists, uh, Science. Um, and um, among other things, I, including being part of um, NCAS, I'm director of a multidisciplinary um, research centre within the faculty that stretches across epidemiologists, fundamental bacteriologists and virologists and also focuses on developing new diagnostics and vaccines for um, control of animal health. So the topic I was, I don't know whether I volunteered for this or I was asked to give it, was antimicrobial use in animals, what do we need to know? Um, and um, well, I've put that in twice, and what do we need to know? I think it was uh, of what do we need and what do we need to know? And I think I've added on the um, what do we know um, and what do we need to know because there are some results coming out of the work we've done over the last year and a half that are starting to come to fruition and Laura Hardyfield will be discussing those results this afternoon so I hope um, as many people as possible can catch it at all because she'll have more detail than I can see here this morning. So I, I was at an infectious diseases physicians meeting earlier this year and for the first time started thinking that I probably ought to declare conflicts of interest. Probably the biggest conflict of interest on there is that I'm a veterinarian and a microbiologist, which probably means I've got an internal conflict. Um, but our group does receive funding from a variety of sources, including commercial sources. Uh, probably importantly, our, our funding from commercial sources is really for vaccine and diagnostic test development. Um, but we are also funded by, by the, the agricultural industries as well. And I have some, some roles uh, as a consultant with the Australian Pesticides and Veterinary Medicines Authority. Those of you from a non-veterinary background, they are effectively the, the animal health, or the, the animal and plant TGA in Australia. So keep that in mind as I go through this talk. So 
what I thought I'd start out with was discussing what the World Organisation for Animal Health, or the OIE, um, has handed down as actions that they're intending to take um, just this year. So what they've focused on is, is better governance with the aim of improving veterinary stewardship of antimicrobials to prevent inappropriate use, collection of data on the use of antimicrobial agents in animals, promotion of prudent and responsible use of antimicrobials in animals, and development of vaccines and alternatives to antimicrobials. I, I think that last one, the last two are particularly important aspects of what we want as outcomes of the work we're talking about. They also um, handed down a few recommendations. Um, the first was that preservation of the efficacy of antimicrobials will sustain animal health and welfare and contribute to food security and safety and protect animal health from zoonotic disease threats. And I think that's particularly important to keep in mind. And my focus as a veterinarian is, while it is on human health, I have a, an inherent interest in that anyway, but my focus is, all, is particularly on animal health. And the rise of antimicrobial resistance is a threat to animal health and to food security, as well as being a threat to human safety. And often that part of the argument gets lost in the discussions, particularly the superbug argument, which becomes very focused on human health rather than animal health. <coughs> And, and it's import, an important risk to the economic prosperity, particularly in developing countries. Because at the moment, a lot of <laughs> food security does rely on antimicrobial use in developing countries, in some developing countries. Um, they also recommended there was adoption of best practices for sanitation, for biosecurity security and animal husbandry, including vaccination programs. So essentially alternatives to control infectious diseases in our animals and the development of guides to alternatives to the, use, to the use of antimicrobials and risk analyses on the best management approaches to reduce the development of resistance and protect animal and human health. I think they're, they're important actions and recommendations to bear in mind as we go forward. <coughs> so if we're trying to optimise antimicrobial use, what do we need to know? Well, first of all, we need to know what antimicrobial use antimicrobials are being used out there in, in the wider community. And here I'm talking about the animal health community. We need, need to know why they're being used, because if we don't know which ones are being used and why they're being used, it just becomes an argument about how much antimicrobial, how many, and how, what the volume of antimicrobial drugs are that are being used in animals. We need to know when they're being used, because they could have a critical impact on the risk of resistance being transferred into into the human food chain. Antimicrobial use very early in the life of an animal is probably a lot less of a risk than antimicrobial use close to slaughtering in the animal being turned into food. We need to know how that use affects the outcome for animals and their owners. And we need to keep in mind that a lot of people have a very close association with their companion animals. And maybe their bigger risk is not in the food that they eat, but in the animals that they share their bed with or that they spend a lot of their time with. And what alternatives are there currently in use or may be, that may be of use in the future to try and reduce antimicrobial use? <coughs> so I think mean, when I talk to an audience that is predominantly medical, I often feel that it's, it's necessary to talk about why antimicrobials are used in domestic animals in the first place. Because I think there is often a misconception that all these antimicrobials are being used to promote more rapid growth in animals. So the reasons that they're used are to enhance health and welfare of animals and to improve their production, but often that is through better disease control. It's, they're used to treat diagnosed bacterial disease. Um, they're used to prevent endemic bacterial disease that, that we can expect to occur at any time in an animal population, particularly under intensive settings. So if we have a large population of pigs together in the same place, we know that they are going to suffer from from a, a several key respiratory diseases at a particular time in their life cycle. And so antimicrobials are used to, to control that disease. They're also used, as they are in human medicine, to attempt to treat undiagnosed disease. And sometimes they are, possibly very often, they are used to treat disease that will not respond to antimicrobials because it's viral in origin. And they are used, and probably more so overseas than in Australia, to improve production. <coughs> But sometimes that improvement in production is better controlled. 
So which antimicrobials are being used? That differs depending on the animal species we're talking about, the production system that those animals are in, differs between veterinarians and it differs between farmers and farming systems. Unfortunately, the only data that we have available at the moment in Australia are the total amounts of antibiotic imported into Australia that have been distributed. And we have, we have the data on what the labels say those antimicrobials are going to be used for, but we have no absolute certainty of knowing that those antimicrobials end up in the animals that, that are indicated on their labels. And so we have no real way of knowing where those antimicrobials are going within Australia. <coughs> we know that use is going to differ dramatically between both food animals and companion animals because we, we understand why antimicrobials are used in food and companion animals and which ones are likely to be used in a broad sense. The usage is influenced heavily by legislation, particularly in food animals. There are quite strict controls on which antimicrobials can be used in food animals. There's this quite diligent pursuit of the occurrence of residues in food of animal origin. And those that searching for residues in food of animal origin maintains quite a tight control on which antimicrobials are going to be used in food animals. But um, that usage is also heavily influenced by what the root of administration is for that particular drug. In some settings, an orally, orally administered drug is going to be more convenient. Um, it, is, it is almost impossible to go around 50,000 chickens in a shed and individually inject them. So they are going to be administered antibiotic orally. And so the only antibiotics that are going to be suitable for treatment of disease in those animals is going to be an orally administered antibiotic. In small animals, we tend to focus more often on use of, in, use of injectables. In individual large animals, we tend to focus on use of injectables. <coughs> it, and it differs depending on the pharmacokinetics of those drugs in different animal species. And so a drug that is suitable in one animal species is not, not suitable for use in another animal species because the pharmacokinetics are not favorable. So there are major differences in patterns of usage between the different animal species and between the different farming systems that we have. When and how are they administered? Well, the timing duration of administration is likely to have a fairly critical effect on the risk of development of antimicrobial resistance, but we have a very a very poor idea of just how big an effect that is going to have. The controls in food animals, as I've already said, are, are based on elimination of residues from, from the animal's body or from the product that we are consuming, not on the effect on resistance in that animal. And there's a, a logic to that. It's a lot easier to measure. It has been for quite a while easier to measure residues. But in effect, we are to, to some extent indirectly measuring what we really are interested in. The concurrent administration of, of antimicrobials to a large group of animals at the same time might have quite different effects to administration to a single animal in isolation. And where the administration of food and water is likely to have a difference compared to injection. And we have little idea of whether multiple antimicrobials are being administered to the same animals and which ones are being co-administered. So there's a lot of questions that we really do need to answer. Why do we need to worry about this in Australia particularly? Well, we have quite different farming systems from many other parts of the world. We have much more reliance on extensive agricultural systems for our sheep and cattle production in particular. Even our dairy production tends to be much more extensive than in many parts of the world. So the risks are going to be quite different. The usage of, usage of antimicrobials is going to be quite different in our farming systems. We have quite a different regulatory regime, and I'll get onto that in a minute, but our regulatory regime has actually been ahead of the curve in a lot of areas um, in the past, in large part probably due to the Jetacar report, which was published over 15 years ago, but had an impact on what we have done about registration of antimicrobials for animal use since then. <coughs> we have different numbers of animal pathogens, different types of animal pathogens in Australia. Our quarantine does keep some pathogens out. In fact, probably the major route of introduction of, of multi-resistant bacteria into our animal populations is probably in us, in humans, because we're the animals that go travelling overseas. Our animals in Australia have very little contact with animals that have, that have come from overseas other than humans. We have a different range of prophylactic controls in place for control of some of the endemic diseases that we have. 
and we have differing livestock distributions and different relationships between our livestock populations and our human populations. We tend not to live on top of our, our um, food animals in Australia, whereas in places like the Netherlands there is a very close association between human populations and animal populations. Our, our usage of um, antimicrobials that are classified as growth promoters is quite low by world standards, it's less than 10%. And we don't know even that, that those antimicrobials that are classified as growth promotant uh, for growth promotant use are actually being used for that purpose. <coughs> so what controls do we have on usage? And I have mentioned some of this already. It differs dramatically um, for the different antimicrobial drugs depending on when they were first registered. So an antimicrobial that was registered 30 or 40 years ago will have quite different controls on its use compared to an antimicrobial that's been registered in the last 10 years. And unfortunately, the controls tend to remain, uh, remain in place fairly historically. There has been an attempt by the APVMA to try and refocus um, some of those um, registration controls, um, and that's been partially su successful, but not entirely. There's much greater control of our use of antimicrobials in food, mammals and birds than in agriculture. Um, because all the use in aquaculture is off-label, so we don't have products registered for use in, in uh, aquatic species. The use in companion animals, so our, our dogs and cats and horses, is much more commonly what's, what we call off-label use. So um, we use drugs that aren't specifically registered for those species in, in our companion animals. <coughs> our regulator, the APVMA, is limited in its capacity to control on the basis of risk of resistance. It actually needs documented evidence of risk to human health to be able to regulate on the basis of resistance. And if there are prior registration conditions, it can be difficult to change those. Um, and change that. And I'll, I'll get on to why that can be important in a second. So I think one of the things that's important to recognise before we start talking about amounts of antimicrobial in use in Australia is to have a good perspective on what the relative numbers of animals are in Australia. So the headline figure is there are 212 million domestic animals roughly in Australia. So roughly seven times the, the number of humans there are, probably a little bit more than seven times. So it's probably not all that, that surprising that there is more antimicrobial being imported into Australia for animal use than for human use. You see the, the relative numbers there. A lot of our animals, so about half of that number are chickens. Um, very small numbers of pigs, only about 2 million pigs in Australia, um, and the rest are ruminants. Now, of those animals, particularly the beef cattle, a lot of the beef cattle and virtually all of the sheep would very rarely see an antimicrobial in their entire lifespan because uh, they are uh, run on extensive grazing properties and they just are not treated intensively like some of the other species are. <coughs> So these are the antimicrobial imports for animal use into Australia in 2010. This is the, the most recent set of data available. I think the APN is probably compiling numbers at the moment for the last five years. And they, they published these data in five-year tranches. So you can see that the, the major classes of antibiotic that are being used in domestic animals, and these are just the antibiotics that are of that are importance in human medicine, are the tetracyclines and the macrolide, pedalide, glucosamide, and pleuromutin group. Um, next would be the penicillins, and there are no, or virtually no fluoroquinolones, certainly no fluoroquinolones used in food animals, small, small amounts used in companion animals. Um, potentiated amoxicillin, still fairly low, and cephalosporins are quite low, and the aminoglycosides are quite low. So I think it's important to keep in perspective that they're the antibiotics we're talking about. Mm. Now, if you can keep that in mind, I'll have to switch to the next slide. Um, a recent publication by Peter Collignon and, um, and others, um, the World Health Organization ranking of antimicrobials, according to their importance in human medicine, identified four groups of antimicrobials as the highest priority critically important antimicrobials. And the antimicrobials they identified, or the groups they identified, were the quinolones, the third and fourth generation peptosporins, the macrolides and ketolides, the glycopeptides, and they haven't bit on the carbapenems. So of that group of 
antimicrobials in Australia, it's principally the macrolides that are of the, the use of which is of concern. Um, and there is some use of third generation kephalosporins in dairy cattle that we, we probably should talk about. But uh, otherwise, the quinolones are not used in food animals, they're used in companion animals, which we still need to be concerned about. The glycopeptides are not being used at all in food animals. Um, there's very, very small use in companion animals. Carbapenems are not being used. Um, the fourth generation kephalosporins are not being used. <coughs> So that's, it's, I think it's important to keep that in perspective when people talk about large volumes of antibiotics being important for animal use. So how do we compare on a world stage? Um, this is not a, a complete picture, but the red line there is the average Australian usage per livestock unit. And a livestock unit is roughly a chicken, um, the size of a chicken. So this is normalised for body mass. Um, so you can see that we're about the same level as Sweden, as we're, we're above Norway, we're above Iceland, but we're well below most of the other European countries that are on that list. Now, I think you do need to take this, this data carefully because this is heavily influenced by the type of animal production that occurs in these, these countries. If there's a lot more pig production, the usage of antimicrobials will tend to be higher. And so our average usage tends to be reduced by the by the fact that we have about half of our animal population in sheep and beef cattle production where there is very little with any antimicrobial usage. But it, it does give us a perspective on how we sit on a world stage. So what don't we know? We don't know where the antimicrobials that we import end up. We, don't, we can't even be certain which animal species they end up in. We don't know at all what they're being prescribed for really. We have a sort of a general idea, an anecdotal idea of what they're being used for, but we don't know absolutely. We don't know how long they're being prescribed for. We don't know how similar prescribing is across different veterinarians and farm enterprises. If the prescribing varies between veterinarians, we don't really know what the reasons are for that variation. We don't know whether variations in prescribing patterns influence the outcomes on the, for those animals. And we don't know how important other antimicrobial substances such as metal ions might be in case selection for resistance. <clears throat> so what's our approach in NCAS? Um, we've conducted a survey of veterinarians over the last year um, assessing their antimicrobial use and their decisions influencing their prescribing focused on prophylactic use in dogs, cats, horses and cattle. Um, so we've got now a reasonable idea from that survey of some of the things that are influencing their prescribing the prophylaxis. We developed and we're trialling a mobile survey tool to facilitate collection of data on prescribing in veterinary practices. And our focus there is actually to, to um, co-opt veterinary students who go out into practices as, as a mechanism for collecting data. And we hope that, that will have both an educative influence on students and their subsequent prescribing but will also give us a good idea of, of why veterinarians are prescribing particular antimicrobials in particular situations. We're aiming to collect data from practice management systems and possibly from insurance claims to give us a better idea of the volume of antibiotic that's being used in different veterinary practices and on the outcomes of treatment with antimicrobials. And we're aiming to develop tools for collection of similar types of data from veterinarians that are practicing in intensive farming enterprises in the future. Um, but we need quite different tools for that situation because the, the way that is managed is quite different from the way it's managed in, in veterinary practices that are focused on companion animals and dairy practice. So our VetNAPS tool, um, this is to some extent a, attempting to be a mirror of the, the NAPS tool that Kaz has already talked about briefly. It's aimed to be a tool for patient-side data collection on antimicrobial prescribing. We're trying to crowdsource the data, as I've said, by deploying veterinary students during their clinical rotations towards the end of their, their training at practices. And to some extent, um, in a nice way, students are an inexhaustible resource because there are fresh students arriving each year. And so we're not, we're not relying on the same people to collect the data year after year. 
which is a risk, a, a very big risk if we go out to individual veterinary practices, which can be only a couple of people deep and will not respond to data collection on a frequent basis. <coughs> um, and as I said, we, we hope we'll focus student attention on choices in any microbial use. <clears throat> what we're interested in finding out from this work is what antimicrobials are being prescribed, why they're being prescribed, what doses are being used. Um, we're not interested in who has prescribed what or which farms are being used, are using which antimicrobials. It's a, an anonymous survey in that sense. Um, but we, we believe this will give us identification of key areas for improving prescribing behaviour. And the aim is really to provide data to enable practices to self-evaluate the veterinarians, to self-evaluate their usage and reflect on their prescribing practices. And all the participating practices that, that are going to be involved will have given consent to involve them. We already have consent from a large number of practices to be involved. What have we found out? Um, I guess one of the interesting findings was that label recommendations on antimicrobials, quite historical label recommendations, are driving some prescribing behaviour. And so this is tending to, at the moment, describe, um, drive over-prescribing of amino, uh, or over-dosing of amino glycosides, particularly gentamicin, and under-dosing with pet propane penicillin. There are some identifiable groups of veterinarians in which antimicrobial prescribing is less optimal. And some of those are kind of surprising. So new graduates appear to be more of a problem than, than older graduates, which certainly surprised me. And Laura will present more of that data this afternoon. Um, the other thing that was interesting, um, I, I guess heartening, was the veterinary profession is, is very well aware of and concerned about the issue of antimicrobial resistance, but really lacking guidance on better approaches to prescribe. And that's probably the most important thing. So to finish up, some recommendations. Um, we, we think we need to develop a sustainable approach to monitoring any, uh, veterinary usage of antimicrobials. That's what we hope the VetMaps um, system will offer. Uh, we need to promote benchmark of antimicrobial use across veterinary practitioners um, to encourage better practice. We need to identify and correct some of these perverse drivers of antimicrobial prescribing, like historical labelling of of antimicrobials, and that probably means we need more dynamic assessment of antimicrobial reg registration and recommendations for use that we currently have. And I'll finish there. Thank you. Right, uh, thanks very much and thanks for the invitation to speak. Ben Howden's my name. I run the State Bacteriology Public Health Lab and sort of reference laboratory that does, has done quite a bit of work in AMR and is increasingly doing work in AMR diagnostics but also surveillance. And I guess I was asked to speak about surveillance which is a huge topic so I'm not going to try and cover all aspects and you know what the ideal model is for global AMR surveillance. There are lots of others are doing that sort of thing. But use some recent Victorian case studies to highlight what some of the successes of good surveillance or surveillance systems might be and how we can use that data. And one of the key issues in surveillance is how you generate data that you can act upon to make a difference. So I mean, there's no point collecting data for data's sake. And a lot of that happens in a lot of the way we do surveillance for various things, I think, in, um, in, in medicine and other things. So we just need to be a little bit careful about that. So a quick overview of surveillance and what the national activities are, but then really focusing on AMR surveillance in Victoria with a few case studies and what some of the strengths and weaknesses of the systems are and what, how this might feed into an idea of an ideal system or an ideal approach uh, in a state or national system. So I, I don't need to really show this slide probably, but when we're thinking about surveillance we need to think about uh, AMR as a one health issue. You've already heard um, that's been alluded to, but we're not just talking about human surveillance, we're not just talking about animals, we're talking about the environment as well. And so as we move forward in designing systems for effective surveillance and action, we need to make sure we encompass all these aspects. And one of the case studies I'll present will highlight uh, some of these issues. Uh, we, we've heard already about the Australian response and uh, the, the strategy for AM, antimicrobial resistance in Australia. And it's worth noting that one of, the, one of the key seven objectives is to develop a nationally coordinated One Health Surveillance, uh, AMR, 
as well as antimicrobial usage. And obviously some of that is already in place and has been brought together, but I think we can optimise the system in a much better way. Why is surveillance important? Oh, That's a key question. Why do we collect data? We collect a lot of data in public health and uh, in hospitals and in, uh, in other places. And why do we do this? I, I guess for AMO in particular, we need to measure the, the size of the problem, the burden of the problem, what its importance is to human, animal, environmental health, and what the impact is. And then the other thing is we need to also be able to detect new issues as they arise. Uh, I've heard about this issue with MCR1 in China. Um, it's probably been around for many years actually and it's a good example of how we don't have an effective system to rapidly detect emerging resistance issues. It's already spread to 19 countries before it's found uh, in China. And so we need to think about how we detect emerging resistance mechanisms and issues in an effective way and ensure we can have rapid control. And then one of the key things about good surveillance is we can accurately measure the effectiveness of interventions. So if you think about stewardship as an important intervention in control and resistance, how do we measure that it's actually having an impact? We need um, surveillance systems that are married to those interventions to be sure that we're actually effectively addressing the issue we're trying to address. So when you think about what, whether the surveillance systems internationally are any good, uh, I guess it's highlighted by this recent global challenge from the Gates um, Foundation all calling for proposals to develop systems for effective AMR surveillance on a global scale. I won't go through this here, but it really highlights that this is clearly recognised as inadequately done at many levels internationally. Um, and that there's a lot of work to do to really develop effective surveillance systems to understand drivers of resistance. And also one of the more recent uh, aspects of effective surveillance is it being able to very well characterise resistance pathogens to understand their transmission dynamics. And I'll briefly mention uh, genomics in a minute. But that's clearly um, through the CDC and through this, uh, this call for the Grand Challenge here is, is one of the um, key measures that uh, is of interest. You've already heard about uh, a little bit about Aura, which is um, come out through the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare and recently released their first uh, report on antimicrobial resistance and utilisation in Australia. And I guess this has been the first, one of the first times that the, you know, these surveillance systems have been brought together under one umbrella and just so that we know what's happening at a national level. You know, there is the active surveillance system which is uh, AGAR, Australian Group on Antimicrobial Resistance, been around for more than 20 years, uh, has recently switched its system to, do, to look at invasive pathogens uh, over the last three years and so they've got a new model for the way they work but they are well established active surveillance system working at the national level. I think what's interesting is that you know, that's nationally collected data, but I'm not sure how well it's recognised at the jurisdictional level where a lot of this action has to take place. And so there's a lot of data that goes from Victoria into the AGAR national surveillance system, but I'm not sure that it actually filters through the jurisdictional level where we're addressing a lot of these um, AMR issues. So that's something to think about. Uh, there's an increasing push for passive surveillance, and that is you're collecting data from laboratories in real time as they generate data on every ice that comes through the laboratory. And so that's using the IT solutions and that's quite complex depending on how the laboratories are set up and how their information systems work. But that has been successfully implemented uh, in, in Queensland, parts of the ACT and also within some laboratories within Melbourne to feed into a national passive surveillance system. And there's also an alert system for critical antimicrobial resistance. So these very high risk pathogens, if they're detected, they're alerted in real time so that at a national level we're aware of what's going on. So this is just one slide from Agar um, which is now working on invasive pathogens across gram positives and gram negatives. And the value of this now is that it actually mirrors what is going on in Europe and their approach to surveillance of AMR in Europe where they look at bloodstream isolates. This is just the example of efecium and vancomycin resistance. And if you plop Australia into the middle of Europe it shows you where we sit in terms of the rates of uh, vancomycin resistance in efecium in Australia compared to European countries are sort of red hot. And so it's good, it's good to be able to compare where we are uh, to international um, uh, agencies and uh, systems, obviously. And I'm not going to go through all the agar data, but it's a, it's a nice example of how useful that data can be. And then what then are the critical antimicrobial resistances that uh, have been decided by the Commission and those that worked on the Aura project? What's interesting here for us, and I think many, uh, although we're certainly expanding outside the hospital system, but many of us who are interested in AMR and stewardship are probably coming from a hospital environment. But a lot of the critical 
antimicrobial resistances that are on this list are community pathogens or STIs, for example, or enteric pathogens. So we're not just talking about BRE, MRSA, or nestloid resistant uh, BRE, we're talking about drug resistant gonorrhea, drug resistant Shigella and Salmonella, which are very much a, a one health issue. And so each time one of these is identified around Australia in a laboratory, they're sent to a car of confirming laboratory and uh, the, the resistance mechanism is confirmed and it's notified at a national level. So what is happening in Victoria? So I'll switch across to Victoria, which what I was mainly asked to speak about. Um, there has actually been quite a bit of activity in various, uh, that has evolved in various ways, not necessarily in a systematic way, but over the years, uh, particularly the NGU lab that I run has been involved in many aspects of AMR surveillance. Um, and I guess the question is how this can be brought together into a better approach to a, a state and national approach to surveillance. So the things that have been done around human isolates is the Victorian Hospital Pathogen Surveillance System. So this is a, a, passive, a surveillance system of all invasive pathogens which has been going for more than 25 years. I'll give you a couple of examples of the value of that system. Uh, we do you know, state-based surveillance for gonorrhea resistance which we feed up to the National Nyseria Network so that goes up to a national level. Uh, more recently involved in the detection of carbapenemase producing enterobacteriaceae and characterization of those. CAR alert activity, so we do the confirming the laboratory work for the CAR alerts and again send that up to it as a national uh, notification system. And obviously ad hoc investigation, so using techniques to determine if putative outbreaks are due to the same organism or not, uh, which is very much a laboratory based clonality testing. And then in terms of a One Health surveillance approach, uh, for more than 30 years the, the lab has been doing uh, AMR surveillance on enteric pathogens from human and non-human uh, sources and so I'll give an example of why, why there's some value in that. One of the key things that the laboratories internationally have done now is to improve their, our ability to characterise resistant pathogens and really determine how they are spreading and how they are becoming resistant. And this is where genomics is the, the hot topic. What do I mean by genomics? I mean we take our putative resistant isolate of interest, we do a genome sequence uh, we ask our friendly bioinformaticians to, to weave their magic in a block bioinformatics black box to really interrogate that <coughs> genome data to tell us things about those strains. For example, how, how they have become resistant, have they acquired a new resistance gene, i.e. MCR1, have they developed mutations in their genome to become resistant to antibiotics, for example, quinolones. But possibly more importantly, how do they relate to each other? Is this transmission of resistance between patients or the patient and the environment and uh, food producing animals, for example? And also evolution. So remarkably understanding how bacteria evolve and spread is very important for understanding why resistance is spreading and how we might do something about it. And all of this can come out of genomics if you've got a good data set to interrogate. Okay, so a couple of examples of things that we've found by using these systems over the years uh, in Victoria. So the VHPSS uh, path, you know, um, invasive pathogen system, so this is, a, this is a data collection system, it's not a collection of isolates, but it's been going for many years and it collects thousands of um, invasive bacterial pathogen results per year. Uh, you know, some of the, most of this is centred around Melbourne, but it, do, it, is, it does cover the whole state. It appears to be an increasing rate of invasive um, bloodstream infection in Victoria over the years and you can get a sense of what pathogens are important over time. Not surprisingly, they're pretty consistent, but there's definitely differences in what you see in hospital and community acquired acquisitions of invasive pathogens. And I guess the nice thing about this system is it includes all community pathogens as well, so we're not focused on hospitals uh, which can bias the results when we're looking at um, types of pathogens and AMR. So a couple of the interesting things that once you have temporal data like this over many years that's consistently collected is that you can see changes in MRSA. So we know MRSA is going away, so everyone who works in the hospital knows that something has happened uh, to really, get, you know, really um, get rid of MRSA in our hospital system. And this is just the proportion of staphylococcus infections, bloodstream infections that are MRSA in Victoria over the years, and it's essentially disappeared. Although you can see that the rates in the community are pretty similar, still around 20%. So you almost have the same risk of having an MRSA from a community bloodstream infection than you do from a hospital one. What, what is interesting is when you look at the data, the, the rates of MRSA in the pediatric population are going up. So that they're falling in all the hospital, uh, in the elderly patients, but there is an increase in pediatric population. And so it's interesting to try and 
potentially explore why this might be. Are these community onset infections or hospital-acquired MRSA infections in the paediatric population? And then the converse of that is uh, EPQM and VRE. So this is 10 years ago, uh, rates of VRE were about 20%. We're now looking at about 60% for all EPQM by culture isolates. And also the, you know, the remarkable increase in the actual raw numbers of EPQM by skin infections in Victoria is quite pronounced. And so there's value in understanding this data or, um, or you know, trying to work out what's going on with uh, particularly um, mesocomial EPQM infections. So the value of this system, it's, a, it's really a combined pathogen and AMR surveillance system. So we get to understand pathogen um, predominance as well as uh, emerging AMR issues. It's well established. And I guess the, the good thing about it is it's led to a, a really collaborative laboratory group around the state who uh, provide this data but are also willing to then go and do um, uh, active investigations, for example, snapshot investigations. And I'll just give one slide about those in a minute which allow us to then go and interrogate the pathogens actually. So this here we're just looking at data, but if you can then go and explore the pathogen uh, through typing and other mechanisms, and you can garner a lot more information about what's going on. And I think that really this data really can uh, identify important changes in pathogen and AMR incidence over time. So this is an example of the VRE snapshot. So I showed you the VRE is becoming a major problem in Victoria, and the same thing is happening at a national level. Um, and one of the major problems is that we're now moving from band B VRE, that is Tycoplanus susceptible to band A, and we have a lot of anecdotal reports uh, about this and some suggestions in the data that this is a problem. And so we were able to go out and do a, a VRE snapshot in November last year where we collected every single EFIQM um, isolate from every, uh, VRE isolate from every laboratory around the state uh, for the month. And we were able to then calculate an incidence of VRE infection and, and VRE bacteremia. And, I think, and this is just a summary of some of the data, but what it shows you here, it hasn't come out particularly clearly, but this is all the hospitals uh, across the state, and we, you know, we've got big hospitals and small ones. But you can see that every single one of them had uh, VRE, so that you know, VRE is a problem in every hospital in the, in the state. And not just that, but many of them have both Van B and Van A. So we know Van A is emerging. It's not emerging in one or two sites. It's actually in the green here in multiple sites around the state. Um, and you can get a sense of you know, how widespread this problem is. When you apply a geno genomics to this data, so you take all of these isolates from around the state and perform a genome sequence, this is a, a phylogenetic tree which I won't go through in too much detail, but it really shows this one very dominant clone at the moment in Victoria, but it's in multiple hospitals. These are all colour coded. So you can see you've got this sense of uh, VRE is across the state it's not, it's not evolving within hospitals as a problem, but it's very dispersed throughout the system. And so there must be something about the, the way this is transmitted between institutions that's important. And I guess we're able to answer that important question of how common VAN A is. It's actually 24% of all clinical isolates now in Victoria, which was, certainly wasn't uh, two or three years ago. And you know, if, this, if you think this is an important issue, this data is important for working out what we're trying to do about it. Uh, so the um, next thing I was going to talk about was a bit more about the enteric pathogen surveillance system. So this is uh, looking at Salmonella, Shigella, E. coli uh, over time and looking at both human and non-human isolates. And this is just a little case study of uh, why collecting this data together is interesting. And so over the last couple of years, we've had quite a few cases of ketraxone resistant Salmonella type humira through the laboratory, which is interesting because it's not been previously described as uh, locally acquired in Australia. Uh, and we had isolates from cattle, from a dog that died, and also some human isolates from Victoria uh, with invasive infections with um, ketraxone resistant, which looked like an ESBL on the, on the uh, screening plate. And what we're able to do is initially do some serotyping to show that they're all the same serotypes. So it looks like they're the same, but I'm not sure exactly how close the relation they are to each other. But when you apply this new technology of genome sequencing, this is the little collection of isolates here. This is the measure of diversity, and actually they're almost completely identical. And you can see that these, all of these resistant isolates in red are almost identical to each other. When you look at the time of uh, isolation, they're more recent, so they're between 2014 and 2016. And they all carry the same um, ESBL CTX79 gene. And so that's sort of quite concerning because we're, and we can look at the, the origin of the isolates, we've got human, bovine, and other all typing into mingled, showing that there's this issue of 
transmission of this drug resistant strain uh, between human and non-human sources. And when you look at the geography of it, uh, for the human isolates, they're a little bit dispersed around the state, but very much the bovine isolates were, were focused in the dairy sort of producing region of Victoria. And so that leads to hypotheses about why this might be happening and what we might need to do about it. And so is there an intervention here? Well, I think it's important that we identify the source uh, of this problem and it really does identify the potential human impact of AMR in, um, in, uh, in cattle. And there's, you know, I guess there's this concern which was already raised by Glenn about possible use of um, third generation kephalosporins in, in dairy cattle. Maybe that's what's driving this, this issue in Victoria and it's something that certainly needs to be addressed. And the last um, case study I was going to highlight was more of a hospital-based pathogen problem uh, about carbapenemase producing gram negatives in Victoria. I think some of the people in the audience have probably heard a lot about this already. Um, but if you go back a few years, what's been happening with you know, carbapenemase producing enterobacteriaceae are one of the major global health threats in terms of AMR. We know that they're almost pan drug resistant, very hard to treat, very high mortality rate. And we've been pretty um, in Australia, we've been pretty lucky not to have too much of a problem with this to date, uh, mainly just having imported cases which have not um, disseminated locally. But over the last few years in Victoria, what we started to see was increasing number of isolates that carry this KP2 gene referred to us. Um, and this led to an investigation as to why this was happening. And at this point, this was a system, an ad hoc surveillance system in a way, because the isolates were being referred for a confirmatory test. There was no system in place to to ensure that all isolates were sent, some of them could have been, some of them were being sent to the state to Jan Bell to do a PCR to confirm it was KPC. Others were being sent to us. Some might have been sent to Westmead. But nonetheless, we were seeing increasing numbers, and it led to, to an investigation. And the initial investigation, when we just looked at where these isolates were coming from, they looked quite widespread, so that was pretty disconcerting. So these are the laboratories around the state from which these isolates were being sent to us over that two-year period. Are these all imported strains from overseas or is there an outbreak in Victoria? Is it in the hospital? Is it in the community? Uh, so we applied, again, the genomics approach. I'm sorry I keep going back to that, but I think it really does help solve some of these questions. And this is the summary on the left, if you ignore the right for the moment, of the genomic data. Again, there's a very small genetic difference between these isolates, but they look like there was four different sort of clusters within, within these isolates that all came from Victoria. So that was enough information for us to say these were more closely related enough to each other than anything internationally that they probably are spreading locally. But you can't really answer that question with genomics alone. You need good quality epidemiological data. And so that led to an investigation where the epi data, the hospitalisation data and exposure and travel data for every one of these cases was fully investigated. And this on the right here is a summary of hospitalisation data. Um, over these few years. And so when there's a bar there, it means they've been in hospital and the colour coding indicates which hospital they were in. I guess what the sense you, you can get from this is that you know, these two big clusters have all essentially been in the same hospital at some point, although the identification of their pathogen was often at a different laboratory somewhere else around the state. So that, that was what was confusing with that sort of initial snapshot. But by overlaying the epi data, you start to understand the transmission dynamics. And the interesting thing was that these two other outlier groups had independent transmission um, networks, so they were different hospitals. There had been little mini outbreaks that had then ceased and stopped, uh, and the epi data confirmed that. <coughs> this is an example of how, how you can drill down right to really understand the details of what's going on. So this was the, one of those little clusters that I mentioned that it had, the outbreak had stopped. There was three cases in one hospital. Uh, they were well recognised at that time, but there was actually a fourth patient in that ward who didn't receive screening because they weren't right in the right place at the right time to get screened and actually moved to a different hospital and then had the, the same isolated. They were genetically indistinct, isolated at that different hospital and then had a secondary transmission event. And so understanding these sort of things allows you to then go back and put in place interventions at the infection control or screening level to stop that happening again. And then one of the more interesting and Certainly more challenging things is that you know, this all started as Klebsiella pneumonia KPC2. So it was the same bacterial backbone and it was the same resistance gene. But then later in the outbreak, we started to see Citrobacter pharmari, not a, a clinical isolate I'm particularly um, okay with, and it's certainly not something you see, see causing clinical infection very, on, very often. And also Klebsiella oxytoca, also with KPC2, coming from the same locations where these other strains have been seen. 
and then through a lot of quite complicated work, you can see that this is a plasmid. So it's not in the chromo it's not in the chromosome. It's a, a free plasmid within the bacteria that can actually jump between bacterial species. And this is an example of whether the plasmid was identical between these these two isolates, but the backbone was completely different. And so that's quite hard to map at a genomic level. So you need the epidemiology on top of that to show you that that's what's happening at the hospital level if you're trying to really track these very drug-resistant um, species. And this has led, to, which I think is, is quite a, a successful outcome here, although there's obviously a lot of work to make sure that this is working at the right level, but it's led to a, a Victorian approach to surveillance for this very high-risk pathogen that includes routine genomics and, and epidemiology data collection to look at transmission networks. And the other thing we can do out of this once we're essentially um, collecting these isolates to do the genomic work is to do standardised antibiogram testing. Uh, and this is just an example of some early work summarising the antibiograms based on, because we also get very clear travel data, region of, of um, potential acquisition of the isolate if it's, it's either Australia or imported. Uh, but you can actually see differences in the, the regional acquisition in the antibiogram data, for example, whether they're susceptible to gentamicin or not. And as this builds up over time, this could be, can be quite useful for empiric management of patients returning with sepsis from other places that, where they may, may have acquired CPE. I guess the other fascinating thing is that when you look at the regions of acquisition, these are all healthcare inpatient admissions, Greece, Asia, but when you go to India, most of them don't even have healthcare exposure. You know, they're coming back with MDM from India without being in the healthcare system. And so understanding those risk factors, which is the epi data linked to the the genomics is pretty powerful in working out what we need to do with patients returning from overseas. And that this, this data is going to be reported and updated every three to six months, so if people are interested in using it for their local guidelines, that's also available. And then the final thing I was going to say before I wrap up is, it's already been alluded to by Kaz, is this idea of um, new emerging resistance issues. And this is the paper from the, the UK where they read the paper from the, the uh, Chinese group on the MCR1 gene. Within a few days, they were able to go back and screen their repository of 24,000 genomes that they have sitting in their data set and uh, identify 15 MCR1 positive isolates. And why is this impressive? Because two or three years ago, what we would have had to do is develop a PCR for this gene, pull all the isolates out of the freezer, culture them, do the PCR, uh, sequence the product, and show them that, you know, and if you tried to do that on 24,000 isolates, that would take you a couple of years, but we can now do this within a couple of days because the genomic data is such a powerful repository of what's going on with these isolates. And in fact, we were able to do this with our 6,000 isolates that we have sequenced here, most of which are salmonellas, but also other gram and found no, none of uh, this gene, at least for what we have, but I don't know what that means for other states uh, within the country. And so I think you know, archive WGS data is an extremely powerful tool for um, retrospective understanding of the emergence of new problems. Okay, so just to summarise then in a couple of minutes, what, you know, what is the optimal system? I'm not going to pretend to know the answer to this. I, I guess over the last few years we've, we've thought about how our systems we currently have in place, which are certainly could be enhanced and improved, but how they've been useful in understanding AMR. Um, if just one slide on what, what a system should look like. I guess from a you know a Victorian jurisdictional point of view, we need to think about what we uh, do and understand that feeds up to a national level. So there's a lot of work going on at the national level to collect AMR data, but we are responsible for acting at a jurisdictional level in, in many cases. And so we need to make sure that there is integration between the state and the national and international approaches. Obviously it needs to be reasonably low cost, comprehensive and reproducible and well standardised. I think the phenotype genotype um, correlation is very important. So we can collect data on uh, resistance phenotypes, but we also need to be able to collect isolates and ge genotypic data on at least a subset or a proportion or in a, in a you know, snapshot sort of way where we do it once, one month per year, for example. Uh, we definitely need a one health approach to this, as highlighted by the Salmonella work. I think the epi is extremely powerful. If there's good quality epi data, then that really enhances the value of, um, of AMR surveillance data. And then, as we've discussed with um, with CAS already, you know, the antibiotic utilisation data and how this impacts on resistance, that's an important loop that needs to be closed so that we can look at that at a state, national and international level. And it needs to be very adaptable. So if a new resistance issue emerges, we need to be able to test for it and screen for it very quickly. Um, 
and, and respond to it because we may be able to prevent the uh, establishment of these new resistance issues in, in the hospital system or the community system. Um, so I'll just thank all the people involved. There's many, many people uh, both in the building but also throughout the laboratories in Victoria that work on all of this stuff and we were very closely linked to the Department of Health and Human Services in this area and also BigMiss who are working closely with us on the uh, CPU data. So thanks very much. I'm happy to take any questions if that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. At the end, okay, sorry, that's my <laughs> problem. Yeah. Okay, uh, thanks to uh, the NCAS team, CAS and others, for the opportunity to speak today. But what I'm going to try and cover off, which I think is quite formidable, and for any who've dealt with healthcare associated data, to be able to explain to you in a snapshot of our time today is a difficult task. Yet what I will do is give you the high points of what it means when we look and when we consider what is or what are data for action uh, at the healthcare health service uh, delivery level. Uh, my background is my association with the Vickness Coordinating Centre, also located here at the Doherty, as uh, the other groups that you've heard from today. Uh, and we've played quite an active role with uh, much of the NCAS work from its um, beginning stages. Uh, I guess you'd say it's some of the unseen work with respect to the planning, uh, the development of uh, data capture tools, for example, uh, because we know that an investment at that point uh, leads to great returns uh, at the end of the day when it comes to the collation, analysis and reporting of data. Good data in is good data out, and I'm sure you've heard that said before. So we at BigMiss have had uh, an experience here spanning now almost 15 years, uh, which was a pioneering role initially, uh, commencing with um, uh, collation of healthcare associated infection data from hospitals in this state. Uh, we started off being a voluntary system uh, funded through the Victorian Department of Health, uh, basing our methods upon the CDC NIS as it was known there. And if we fast forward now to the current uh, year 2016. We're dealing now with electronic data feeds, we're dealing with push of button data reporting to hospitals, uh, real-time uh, data in many senses and uh, customizable reports that they can use for quality improvement. Uh, we're also looking at very sensible ways and have done so for many years at peer grouping our hospitals in this state and we actually have a mandated approach. All hospitals in this state submit data to the system. I'm sure you'll agree that this has some similarities and commonalities when we think about the AMS space uh, in terms of a pioneering role, in terms of one that is geared towards meeting the needs uh, of all sectors uh, in the nation. The background you, you all understand is of increasing antimicrobial resistance. We see that through various uh, facets, whether it be through healthcare associated infections, which we see, uh, but also antimicrobial usage patterns uh, can be affiliated with particular resistance profiles. And as Ben's already so well explained for us, the throughput in a lab, whether that's reference or primary lab, uh, is changing. And this reflects the antimicrobial resistance that we have on our doorstep. Needless to say, we need robust monitoring systems. If we don't, uh, we will be unable to perform longitudinal analysis looking at historic data, comparing it with the current. We'll be unable to benchmark our local programs will be just that, they'll be local programs unable to be networked or handled at a regional or national level. And underpinning all of this is the need of course for quality improvement which AMS is really centred upon this at a hospital level, at a health service level, improvement in service delivery. Uh, at a glance, I say this in a very positive light that AMS is in evolution. It was in the late 1990s when the IDSA put forward guidelines and a recommendation if you like for stewardship. Uh, to target or to uh, reduce risks for antimicrobial resistance. About 10 years later, we saw guidelines for institution if they wanted to start doing AMS activities in their own site. Uh, and then in the, last, in the last 10 years, we've seen published reports now of the impacts of AMS in health. Initially, this was in adult, uh, sometimes ICU populations, but now many 
many more uh, other groups, smaller groups, uh, even paediatric groups that are being reflected through the literature. Uh, to the point now that we're seeing recommendations and guidelines even based upon meta-analysis of data in the AMS space. So a huge and a growing area now, yet one that is a green and a relatively green space. And the reason I highlight that is because that's a real opportunity. It's a real time now for us to move upon AMS and to ensure that the frameworks are in place nationally that allow us to report sensibly and report data for quality improvement. So I'll just quickly uh, look at this question of what is data for action? What would core data elements look like in the AMS space? And then some of the key challenges that we have before us as we look to uh, collate and analyse uh, data concerning AMS. You've all heard this term, uh, data for action. You may not have stopped to think about what it actually means. Uh, data for action, we, 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 we glean this really from quality improvement processes in healthcare uh, and it implies that we have mechanisms in place whereby we can measure a baseline performance uh, and then we can periodically measure future improvements, so that's the basics. Um, but what it entails is, that, is then that we have a reporting system in place so that we can continuously see, the, see data uh, and that these data must then become or must be valid uh, accepted by stakeholders, must be reliable, must be reproducible and must be accurate. And this grows and increases over time as the system develops. You've all probably also seen the quality improvement feedback loop, uh, which I'm not going to talk to today, but I just wanted to uh, raise this because at every step of quality improvement, you're reliant upon uh, robust data informing the process. If the data are undermined or if there is a question of validity or reliability, then the quality improvement cycle will spiral down and not spiral towards truly improved practice. Uh, these guidelines have been proposed by a group in the States that have been involved with some very large quality improvement programs. They talk to the flexibility of data handling. And I love the quote uh, at the bottom, which is that for quality improvement, we need the right data in the right format and at the right time. A simple premise, but one that we have to keep in mind when we're dealing with data concerning uh, antimicrobial usage and stewardship. I'll just uh, very quickly highlight for your attention uh, some quality improvement exercises that have occurred uh, nationally uh, in the infection prevention space. You'll probably have heard of the CLABSI prevention project through the US in the early 2000s led by Peter Pronovost and others. Uh, but this program uh, relied upon a uniform and acceptable case definitions for infection in hospitals, in ICUs. Uh, data were embedded very quickly into usual and standard workflow practices. And they set some very simple targets and messages. And if you've heard that term A to zero, it was this study and some others at a similar time that have led us to this understanding. You may not agree with that concept, uh, but this, is, this was very well understood by the public, uh, very well understood by specialists outside of uh, ID and infection prevention. The other example is of the MRSA reduction uh, program uh, in, the, in the UK, which you will again be quite aware of, I'm sure, but this program span, has spanned about 15 years. Um, initially a lab-based system, public health laboratory network, lab-based definitions for infection, uh, rolled out throughout trusts. Uh, then they engaged the users who said, we don't like it because it's telling us we've got infections in our hospital, but it wasn't due to our care. So they then refined the definitions and enabled a hospital to opt out or to say that it was due to their own standard of care or lack thereof. Uh, data were continuously uh, fed back and that then enabled them to set some thresholds and targets. So again, a process that was in evolution but reliant very heavily upon quite robust data. I could mention for you other examples and some negative ones too in the infection prevention space, but we need more than just quality improvement in infection prevention. We need this widely in AMR and um, we need to see quality improvement in our prescribing practices. So if we were to think about what would be essential or minimum data elements for an AMS program, uh, I like to think of these seven and we continuously throw these around when we're talking with uh, the NCAS streams uh, to talk about, have we thought about this, have we thought about this, do we need to consider this together? Because these we may not be able to tick off at the beginning but we can always work towards this as the program evolves and as it matures. We must identify an appropriate measure of healthcare performance. No use picking up off a healthcare um, issue that has no cost, negligible morbidity or mortality. We've got to go with the big ticket items. We must define our patient populations very carefully 
you'll note with the NCAS work, we're very careful with acute care, aged care and, and others that we don't overlap and that we talk to these specifically. There are specific prescribing patterns that pertain to each. Standardised case finding, validation of data, which I'll speak to in a moment. We must support with resources and infrastructure. It's very helpful to have someone at the end of a phone. Very helpful to have a, an email contact point when you're developing a regional uh, or a network system. Um, reporting of data must be done appropriately, whether that's by rates or otherwise, and there must be risk adjustment built into that. And we must produce useful reports that are understood by the stakeholder and then use the feedback we receive to modify how, they, how those data are presented. So we continuously use this in the infection prevention space, but there are direct correlates when we speak uh, of AMS. These are what have been proposed, these metrics, by the IDSA just recently uh, as possible measures to evaluate interventions to improve antimicrobial use. Uh, five process and five outcome measures listed here. I'm not suggesting that we need all of these to be operational in Australia, but it's just to make you think. Some of these are very good at a hospital level. Others of these may be very much better at a networked or at a regional level. There's not a lot of value sometimes in looking at 30-day mortality in a hospital that has 20 beds. Uh, yet at a national level, if we're able to show a mortality benefit, that's a very, very powerful uh, directive in terms of appropriate use of data. Uh, C. diff infections are another outcome measure there, which you'll note is plausible, you know, something that's reasonable. And it's good that we're seeing some national discussion on this to open up the box a bit as to how we measure and how we report uh, C. diff. Um, if I can walk you through then, the micro to the macro. AMS can occur at the micro level, the hospital level there on the left, and we've got some terrific um, steps forward uh, that have already been mentioned by uh, our, our speakers here today as to how a hospital should structure its AMS activity. Um, we then move to how should hospitals start to work together. We know a little bit about that through some of the international guidelines, but not a lot. And then how should we work as a region when it comes to handling data? Well, that's a big, a big black box, but an exciting space, and this is where NCAS comes to the fore. Don't please be put off by the detail here. I just want to highlight to you that as we move from micro to macro levels, there's a growth in how we've got to deal with the data. We've got to start thinking about risk adjustment and peer grouping of data if we're talking about regional data. Whereas if we're talking about a single centre or small number of centres, these issues are not so relevant. Uh, if we're dealing, again, with larger data sets, big data sets, we've really got to consider data validation as a very important element and inbuild this to how we handle data. Uh, data thresholds and targets is a question perhaps uh, for later. But I just want you to, to see that there's a growth and that as the system matures and expands, the needs, the data elements must also grow. So what are some of the challenges with handling um, AMS data? And I'll just take perhaps a minute on three of the big ticket items here. But again, I, I know many of you in the audience and your backgrounds will be um, such that you understand the real challenge of complex systems in healthcare. Uh, a hospital may have an electronic medical record or it may have varying shades of grey of such. It might have partly paper, partly electronic. And that's just one issue. There are multiple others into how healthcare systems integrate. How do we then extract data from such uh, a mishmash and, and, and such a complex um, environment? Are there also regulation and legal issues concerning um, healthcare-related data, privacy uh, and the like? And these all impact upon surveillance for quality improvement. The first challenge I want to just highlight for you, uh, which I've spoken a little, is uh, concerning data validation. Uh, it's really, really important that data are valid, mainly um, when you're talking about national program, for example, it's to ensure, first of all, that stakeholders have faith and a trust in what they're reading and what they're viewing as an outcome from the program. They must believe that what you're saying is, is truly what you're saying, that the infection you're referring to is truly the infection. Um, with AMS, of course, we tend to uh, check off as to whether prescribing is according to guidelines, whether it's adherent, or whether it can be assessed in an objective way using a tool of appropriateness. And um, NCAS has weaved both, uh, really, into its assessment, for example, through the, the survey's work, um, to ensure that we're looking at it from all facets and to ensure that we can measure this in an appropriate way as deemed by stakeholders. We don't quite know how often we should test validity. We don't know the ideal way of doing it. Uh, but we have, have works in place to measure this and to look at inter-rater reliability even within our own data sets. 
you'll note one of the challenges is that guidelines change over time. So when you look at how compliant a hospital was five years ago to now, you've got to ensure that you have a shifting uh, goalpost uh, when it comes to your assessment. Validity is an extremely complex area, both internal and external validity. But I'll just point you to the top one, which is the crudest and the weakest, perhaps the poorest measure of validity, which is face validity on face value. In fact, this is the one that comes to the fore from day one when you're dealing with large data sets. This is the one the public are concerned about. This is the one that non-specialists in an area start to raise their eyebrows if the data do not hold face validity. And this is why I love the concept of the infographics, the simple, the um, digestible form of data, which really addresses this very early to enable us to look in our own ways at the deeper levels then of how valid the system is. I'm intrigued that recent data also show that clinicians, when they assess the appropriateness of antimicrobial prescribing, that they agree with the standard in about 80% of cases. This is data recently from the Netherlands, which I find quite intriguing is that we see some divergence, but not a huge uh, divergence when it comes to this element. One of the huge strengths of NCAS has been the development of this tiered assessment tool uh, for assessing um, appropriateness of prescribing, ranging from optimal right through to uh, inadequate. And this really enables, of course, you can understand the, the, the benchmarking to be uh, to hold true, enables longitudinal data to be compared within an individual facility. Second challenge which I'll raise, and I, I will be brief, I do promise, uh, is that of setting of targets and of public reporting. Uh, this question uh, is one that uh, we were very intrigued with, for example, when it came to the My Hospital's website release of uh, Staph aureus bacteremia some years ago. And we, we suddenly uh, were in the position where there were people commenting to particular thresholds and targets. Some of the questions had not actually been envisaged at the very beginning. For example, lay public started saying, we don't know what Staph aureus is, but we do understand what golden Staph is. So the whole language in terms of how a target threshold was conveyed was not on par at the very beginning and had to be modified. I note very interestingly that in the US, the CMS Medicaid system now has checkpoints that have been proposed uh, for AMS programs in the US. And you may not fully understand what that means, but what that does mean is that it can be linked now with the funding of healthcare facilities if they choose to and opt to have these measures uh, in place. A very, very powerful um, means of achieving change but outside of our own health sector. I'm not suggesting that we have paper performance schemes in place here in Australia, but it's one that's well worth considering is that um, when a threshold is set or when a framework uh, is set, um, there will be comparison and uh, hospitals will want to compare themselves one with another. Uh, we know there are many, many questions when it comes to public reporting without very many answers in Australia when it comes to public reporting of healthcare associated infections. Uh, but not so with AMS. Uh, AMS has not navigated or steered through these borders yet. And this is why I say it's a real opportunity for us now to look at how we will appropriately uh, convey the messages that lead to quality improvement. And finally, just the question or the challenge of data linkage. Uh, and I guess with that, I, I like to think of trend analysis. Um, our other speakers have already indicated that we can't sort of see uh, individual data streams here working in isolation. Uh, it's very important that we see antimicrobial usage data put alongside antimicrobial resistance data. And nowhere nationally have we yet uh, seen a good, a good framework or a good tool proposed whereby we can see this and observe trends. Which organisms should we be looking at? Uh, which, which drugs and, and over what time? Are there sentinel drugs, sentinel bugs that ought to be in the limelight? And whilst we don't have answers to that yet, I would suggest that the time now is for us to ensure that we have the granular elements in place uh, through the NCAS works to ensure that we're future-proofed. Um, for example, ward-level data versus hospital-level data. If we're looking at a ward, let's say an ICU with antimicrobial prescribing practices, uh, we want to be sure that we're dealing, when we're looking at antimicrobial uh, resistance profiles, that we can in some ways obtain an insight into the resistance profile in that ICU and not be comparing with the hospital at large. It might sound like a detailed issue, but it's just questions such as these that I'm referring to when I say the granular elements of data. We need to be sure how we're defining populations and points in time. 
Uh, so just to uh, close here today, I, I, I'm sure you will agree with me that it, the time certainly is right for a national program. Um, it's, it's early days in AMS uh, when we look at some of the other uh, contributing um, streams in AMR. But this is a great time because with AMS now and with works such as the NCAS streams, we can improve safety and reduce harm very quickly. Uh, whereas reducing antimicrobial resistance may be a medium and a longer term goal, but nonetheless one that we are very well um, positioned to address. We must ensure that data inform. At the hospital level, we want to see quality improvement. We want medical people, we want nursing staff, we want pharmacists, we want quality and safety, we want hospital executives all on board to understand data to ensure that they can action this at the local level. But the, uh, the, the beauty of NCAS is that we now have big data which can enable international benchmarking and will lead to the informing of policy. We must recognise the challenges as I've already alluded to. I won't uh, talk further to that now, but we can build questions into how when we're working collaboratively uh, here at the Doty, we've got questions that we'd like to see resolved as the program moves forward. Uh, because some of the things cannot be addressed at day one, but we'll do so as we have more and increasing data. And the new frontiers for data will, of course, uh, be related to data linkage. And the Scottish, uh, of course, have taken the infection intelligence platform approach, whereby they're linking antimicrobial resistance, infection prevention, uh, and stewardship data um, into some programs there. It's rec well recognised that these must be now integrated and coordinated. And this is indeed our outlook as we consider data handling uh, through NCAS. And uh, I think public reporting is also a very exciting area to ensure that we're meeting all stakeholders, not just the general lay public, but also all areas of health uh, and supporting our stakeholders when it comes to our stewardship. So thank you. And again, I'm sure there's questions to follow. So I'll hand to Kirsty. Thank you. hoping you've all got the stamina to last for one more talk. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Kirsty Hughes and I'm an infectious diseases physician and I'm deputy director here at NCAS. Um, and the job I've been given this morning was to think about the regional strategy to address antimicrobial resistance and particularly to look at the role that NCAS might play nationally and internationally. Um, Sharon set this up beautifully this morning by just make, reminding us all that antimicrobial resistance is an urgent global public health priority and I think the attention has been drawn on this issue um, and we all know how dangerous antimicrobial resistance may become. But I wanted to remind us too that AMS or antimicrobial stewardship is not just about antimicrobial resistance, it's about patients getting good care. Um, it's about patients getting high quality and safe care when it comes to preventing or treating infections. And I think a really important um, publication that happened last month that was focused on Victoria, but for those of you from interstate, um, it's well worth a read, um, was a safety and quality review in Victorian healthcare, primarily focused on hospital care, um, the Duckett Report, um, which really uh, highlighted some of the opportunities to develop a systems-wide approach to improving the safety and quality of care um, in Australian hospitals. Um, we should remind ourselves that a great deal of harm in healthcare is preventable and that antimicrobial resistance and hospital acquired infections are excellent examples of these. But there is a demand for a coordinated comprehensive service to help ensure that care is appropriate. That evidence-based best practice needs to be disseminated through a structured network so that all um, patients get good care and that includes rural areas where services may not be as thick on the ground and that there needs to be ongoing measurement and accountability for action. And this is where NCAS, I think, sits wholly and solely square in the middle of all of this because we are under the umbrella of health services research. So we understand that this is about setting up systems to make sure that we make it easy for people to do the right thing. You've seen this slide before, but I think it's really important. Um, Australia's first national strategy to address antimicrobial resistance highlighted five objectives. Um, and it's a terrific um, document, in fact. And I'm going to use, oh, sorry, I said five, I meant seven <laughs> objectives. I'm going to use these seven objectives to highlight what I think the role of NCAS may be, because in fact, 
Although a couple of our earlier speakers have picked out a couple of these as highlights, I think we play a part in all seven. So what does this document say that we need to address AMR? It says we need education, capacity building amongst our staff and increased awareness amongst both staff and the community. Um, we need to be implementing AMS practices. We need resources, tools and access to expert help. We need good surveillance, which Leon's just done a brilliant job of describing to you, and that needs to cover AMR, as Ben's described, antimicrobial usage, and I keep saying clinical outcomes too, because we can't forget that. And it must be robust data, valid data, and it's got to be meaningfully analysed so that actionable uh, results come out of it. They're not just reports that get filed away. Infection prevention needs to be coordinated with antimicrobial stewardship. Research has to be central to all of this and we need to be doing research around management strategies, new diagnostics and drug development. International partnerships need to be built with collaboration and governance and, and policy direction needs to be taken into account so that change can be embedded and then that people become accountable for that um, change. So let's think about what NCAS currently do. Um, and yes, we tick the boxes in all of these spaces. So we do do capacity building amongst non-ID experts as well as advanced courses for experts across a lot of different disciplines. We are, we, implementing AMS practices is central to our activity. So we are very aware of um, the issues around organisational change, behaviour, addressing behaviour and looking at workflow. And we're um, developing resources, tools and access to expert advice, which I'm going to be fleshing out a little bit more for you later on in this talk. We are developing robust surveillance tools and we're interested in the proper training of auditors so that the data we're getting is good data. Um, and we help people to analyse their own data um, so that they know what they can tease out and where they need to focus their attention. We've got really strong links to good um, infection prevention services and you've heard from some of the key people from Vickness and MDU this morning. We are sitting in an institute that has research at its heart um, and we are interested in understanding health services and evaluating the impact of interventions. We are building international partnerships. The last 12 months has been really exciting for us in this area. Something that we're doing in an ongoing way is providing mentorship to a lot of our um, colleagues from other countries and strategic advice to a lot of the um, policy makers in other countries. Um, and we're, we're very interested in, in um, participating in expert advisory groups so that we can try to influence policy and that we can play a role in advocacy. So I'm going to step you through some of these um, through the course of my talk. With regard to education, some of you may already well know about these, but this is an example of some of the courses that we've been running. A lot of this has been run off the smell of an oily rag, um, you know, voluntary participation from some of our um, experts to be doing the teaching, but it's been extremely rewarding. We've seen a workforce in people who have an interest in antimicrobial stewardship build up around the country, and that's really exciting. Um, the nurses and infection control practitioners have become involved and they're very enthusiastic and wonderful allies in, in um, promoting antimicrobial stewardship. Pharmacists have been there from the start. They do a lot of the groundwork here and um, we initially had forums that focused on building expert AMS pharmacists but moreover we've been moving toward understanding what a general pharmacist on the ward can be doing to help improve prescribing. And uh, we have started our travelling road show. So Teams of us are getting in cars and driving up to um, little country towns and the, the number of people who will drive four or five hours to that country town to hear us um, give them a talk and give them some tools and help build their skills so that they can go back to their small rural hospital and address um, or start to work on any microbial stewardship has been incredibly exciting um, and we're looking to, to try and develop that a little bit further. Um, and with regard to awareness raising, well, well, obviously events like the NCAS forum and I, I would say that a lot of the work in the veterinary sphere is probably still a little bit in the awareness raising um, part but as the data come in and we start to understand where the education needs to be targeted it will be able to move up into the, the education um, sector. Implementing tools, well we got into this space very early on with electronic decision support and guidance has been a flagship part of NCAS right from the word go. Many of you will know about guidance but it's now in over 65 hospitals in four states. We've been going for more than 10 years and as Cass said we've got uh, I think 18 people working on this so we're robust um, 
Uh, we have our program in all hospital type, all hospital types, private hospitals and very small rural hospitals as well as large ones. And we tackle the full cycle of antimicrobial stewardship uh, in a hospital setting. So we, we're not just an approval system. That's where we started, but we grew way beyond that. Um, so we do we have a, um, an excellent post-prescription review tool, which I've got a little snapshot of there, which is currently called iReview. Um, we're linked Guidance is the entity that delivered NAPS, so um, the auditing tool comes from Guidance, and we've got decision support tools that are growing. So um, some really interesting work has been done on decision support around uh, risks of fungal infections and things which uh, watch this space. We're also meeting new challenges. When we started 10 years ago, electronic prescribing was perhaps a long way in the future, but right now we are working on integrating with Cerner in Prince of Wales Hospital, for example, so um, we're, we're meeting those challenges. Developing resources. I'm going to finish my talk by actually diving in and showing you some of these resources because this is where I think NCAS can play an enormous role. Um, I want to come out very early on and say that we don't see ourselves as being about developing guidelines. Um, I think there are great um, groups that do that already, like therapeutic guidelines, um, but we're about enabling people to follow those guidelines. So we dive down and try and figure out what, what are people doing wrong? What's, what are the barriers in their way and how do we make it easy? And a lot of that is about digesting the guideline down to something simple like a clinical pathway um, or talking to our users so that we can understand where the misunderstandings are happening and then developing some information sheets that directly address those misunderstandings. So some examples you'll see here which are not yet on our website but will soon be are around management bundles for things like Clostridium difficile diarrhoea or Staph aureus bacteremia. And down here, um, an, an interpretation of a midstream urine sample, which um, really quickly we realised when we started to work in the aged care sector that um, there are big problems there with how people interpret those results. So, so getting um, plain language information out there that directly addresses the misconceptions is important. And I'll show you a little bit more about that a little bit later on. Access to expert advice is something that NCAS thinks we can play a key role. In fact, very early on, um, we were amongst the early adopters of this concept of post-prescription review board rounds and, and antimicrobial stewardship teams going around hospitals and trying to convince um, our colleagues around um, how that might work and how it wouldn't impose on the ID consult service but, um, and, and whether our colleagues would, would accept advice coming from an ANS team. But, We've grown beyond that um, and we're starting to now look at novel strategies and, and Tom Schultz, who I think is in the audience, was um, really a, a, one of the pioneers around um, providing AMS ward rounds by telehealth and, and our service there is, is growing as well. And, um, so we're supporting rural sites and, and it, fascinatingly we're, we're supporting rural private hospitals um, because these places can't get access to a local ID uh, doctor. Um, uh, and yet their patients deserve access to expert advice. So we're finding ways to deliver this. Um, many of you will already know a lot about the NAPS, the National Antibiotic Prescribing Survey, and this is growing very quickly. So we started as a hospital program. This is a snapshot of our um, website. We started as a hospital program. We moved into aged care. Glenn's already told you about the veterinary NAPS. And we've de we're developing, um, sorry, the surgical NAPS has been piloted and some of you may well have participated in that pilot this year. And we're developing dedicated audit tools that will look at usage for particular drugs or usage for particular conditions so that we can drill down in more detail so to get some of the clinical data out. Um, and this uh, has been met, uh, well received by our colleagues. We've also developed standardised tools um, that teach our auditors how to collect data in, in an appropriate way. So um, there are online um, modules that people need to complete before they're, um, I guess, um, certified or authorised to be the auditor for their hospital for NAPS now. Um, I've just realised this graph, there we go. Um, the NAPS in 2015, the 2015 being report is about to be released. Um, it is a point prevalence audit of antimicrobial use across Australian hospitals and we know that about 40% of admitted patients are receiving antimicrobials and this graph just illustrates the escalating number of participating hospitals and the different sizes of hospitals participating. In 2015 we were at 281 hospitals participating in that single point prevalence audit, over 20,000 prescriptions and our 
percentage of inappropriate prescribing in our hospitals is sitting at the moment, or sitting, was sitting in 2015 at 23%. That is a little bit better than what it had. We had been as bad as 30%, I think, in, in um, 2013, so a little bit of improvement. Um, and we've also documented some improvement with regard to prolonged surgical prophylaxis, so an improvement down by 8%. But um, uh, we're now getting this longitudinal data where we can start to show change over time. As, we, as more and more hospitals are developing, we think AMS programs may be part of the reason why we're seeing some of this improvement. Working with infection prevention, which was point four of the national strategy, well, I've already said we work with key groups. They're doing great work in, in documenting um, numbers of infections, both in hospital and community, and looking at pathogen resistance profiles, looking at the isolates themselves. But of course, we're now starting to align this with data on antimicrobial use, correlating usage with resistance and using data to inform guidelines around how uh, observing how patients are being managed and what their outcomes were. And, and there's huge opportunities there. But I wanted to illustrate one example of us working with um, an infection prevention service, and that is the aged care NAT. So, Many of you may know that Vignis had moved across into the aged care space and was starting to collect data on um, prevalence of, of infections amongst residents of um, aged care homes. And we saw an opportunity to couple that up with prevalence of antimicrobial use and trying to link those, the antimicrobials with the infections. So this was a fantastic um, collaboration. Um, we've run the audit two years in a row now. Um, the most recent data from 2016, in fact, we have 251 residential aged care facilities from all states in Australia participating in this. Um, we collected data on um, 1,800 prescriptions. Uh, there were private, not-for-profit and, and public government um, facilities that participated. Um, not surprisingly, we're still seeing very poor documentation around antimicrobial prescribing in aged care homes with um, an inability to identify the indication for a prescription in a significant percentage of patients, and no structured plans around the duration of therapy or even a review date for almost half of prescriptions. Um, the most common indication being urinary tract infection, not surprising to us. This one I've done in red nearly knocked me over the first audit that we did, and the second audit, it's almost an identical figure. Um, so I think it's real, um, you know, that, that a quarter of antibiotics have been prescribed for more than six months for these residents. It's an extraordinary um, piece of information. And for those who are getting their antimicrobials for less than six months, about a third of them, um, there's no documented signs or symptoms of infection that we can um, um, identify um, for those particular residents. So we're collecting information on their clinical features at the same time in order to, to determine whether they've got an infection for the infection prevalence component and it's not really matching up for a third of the residents. Um, research and data for action, Leon's done a great job here, um, but our strategy, our philosophy from NCAS is around data being collected as part of everyday workflow. Um, I've already highlighted antimicrobial resistance and usage being a target. Clinical management of infection is a target for us. And so looking at the particular infection events and the therapies used and the clinical outcomes for those patients, I think there's a lot for, to be gained in us diving into this area, which is why we're looking at those dedicated audits around, let's say, CPE management or um, staphylococcus management and those sort of things, because it may help us to tease out where the research questions are that, that warrant a clinical trial down the track. Um, and infection prevention needs to be linked in with the research that we're doing around AMS. Um, so what is happening, how does it compare, um, and how does it change with interventions are some of the key things we're focused on. And case is, um, I've said, very um, well placed to be influencing policy, um, to provide data to help advocate for change and improvement and um, inform expert-led, evidence-driven policy. So a lot of information about um, antimicrobial resistant organisms um, and antimicrobial prescribing and what local prescribing policies might be and how that needs to um, inform higher up policies. Um, these are examples, hopefully this is very familiar to you, but I think some of the experience and, and the learnings that we're gathering from N our NCADS activities is helping us to work out um, what is feasible and practical in terms of things like clinical care standards or indeed hospital accreditation standards. You know, are people able to do this? What's, what's a reasonable thing to be asking of um, hospitals? So the final point I'm going to talk about is international engagement. And this is where there's been 
um, real growth for us in the last couple of years. So I was brainstorming what are the key issues when it comes to antimicrobial stewardship um, in our region. And I think many of you will be very familiar with these. Some of them NCAS can assist with, and very clearly, some of them are huge and NCAS is not the solution. Um, but you know, we can play a role in advocacy and, and, and helping with policy direction. But lack of clinician capacity and expertise is something we can definitely do. And we've had people coming here for mentorships for some time. We've had doctors coming, um, and more recently pharmacists have started to come. And, and shadow us on ward rounds and look at what we're doing here in Australia. Um, a really big learning for us when we travelled to some Southeast Asian countries to provide the WHO consultancies was the complete absence of clinical pharmacists. In enormous thousand bed hospitals, there's no one actually reviewing the drug chart. Um, you know, there's a, there's a huge need for capacity building in that sector. Um, the lack of training in terms of advanced AMS, so um, we can help with that. The lack of rational prescribing guidelines, again, we can play a part in, in helping to digest evidence and, and work out what is feasible and, and what is rational and appropriate. Um, lack of diagnostic tests, maybe the, the MDU group can help with some of this, um, but I think more importantly is guidance on the appropriate use of tests because we visited a lot of hospitals that had whiz-bang um, facilities in terms of you know, PCR machines, Molitos, but they had no idea how to use them appropriately to inform practice. So I think we can play a role there. Meaningful interpretation of data is key and we can do a lot to assist there. So um, Kaz has briefly alluded to this, but we were seeing uh, antibiograms that were completely um, being misrepresented um, because they were based on skewed data. Um, Absence of resources and tools, um, that's the final one I put a big tick against, but there are um, some of the tools that we're developing for our own national um, uh, hospital use would be very applicable to some of our international colleagues and I think we can play a role there. And there are bigger issues like the complete absence of a medication chart, which I didn't think a hospital could function without a medication chart, but I visited one that does. So, uh, you know, situations where nurses are writing um, the drugs required for their patient on bits of paper that are screwed up in their pocket and there's no documentation of, of um, what was intended to be prescribed or whether the drug was actually given. So there, there's real work to be done there. Um, there are much bigger things that I think we can play a role in terms of advocacy here. We're not going to have the control, but um, pharma incentives to prescribers are a very big issue. Over-the-counter access and poor regulation um, of drugs, huge issue poor access to medication. So, you know, good prescribing is about people who need antibiotics getting them in a timely way and, and there are obviously very big problems there and drug costs um, are a challenge for many communities and counterfeit medications. And I'm sure that this goes on, but um, uh, some of the examples uh, I hope to, to illustrate to you is, is this is where NCAS is starting to play a role. So New Zealand and a number of Pacific Islands are going to participate in our NAPS audit, which is really exciting. And we, there's an emerging initiative that we're collaborating with the Therapeutic Guidelines Foundation in the Pacific Islands um, to try and uh, enable them to do what we did, which was get an idea of what's actually going on on the ground. So get some good data um, that says, what are people doing? We, we can write guidelines to we're blue in the face, but we need to understand what they're really doing to work out where we need to be targeting our attention. Um, we've mentioned the readiness assessments that we did for hospitals in a number of Southeast Asian countries earlier this year and we hope to develop that relationship further with WHO Wipro region. And we've got a grant under consideration at the moment, which if it comes up will be very scary, um, but it's looking at um, assisting um, many hospitals in Kerala state in India to do an apps to find out what's going on in terms of their prescribing and actually implementing our AMS software, the guided software, in a number of large hospitals in India. So we're very excited about that and obviously the impact of that could be really important. Um, and I've mentioned our mentorships with Southeast Asia and I think there's other collaborations that we're actively working on at the moment with North American colleagues as well. So, um, you know, I think we're going from strength to strength. So I'm going to finish by answering that question, how can NCAS play a role, uh, by saying we have a huge role to play. And I see that in showing leadership, in co coordinating activity, um, in helping our colleagues to adopt cutting edge practices, but making it practical and relevant. We want to make it easy. Um, to always be studying the effects of our interventions, so not doing anything off the cuff, but actually using the opportunity to find out what's happening. 
And I think NCAS's role is in translating evidence to everyday practice and to allow real life questions to inform the research direction. So it's a two way flow. Um, I think NCAS can be the bridge between research and patient care. Um, and that little graphic is an effort to try and illustrate that. And my very last slide was in fact to um, introduce and thank Rod James, who's sitting down in the corner doing all the hard work for us to make this forum pull off very well. He, he and Susan Liu, who's in the audience somewhere, are right at the back, have been working extraordinarily hard on the NCAS website, which has been something that's been a bit of a dream of ours for a couple of years. And I'm excited, hopefully, to be able to launch it today um, by demonstrating to you uh, what we've got. So let me see if I can get this to work. Uh, no, <laughs> don't do that. What do you want me to do? Cancel? Uh, so I close that over and let's see if I can get this. So the, the web address is www.ncas-australia.org. Oh, let me see if I can move that out of the way. Um, and this, um, we're obviously going live today, so you can go home and start to play with this. It's available on your desktop, it's available on your mobile phone. Um, and we want this to be um, something that's going to grow with time and we're hoping to be open and collaborative with all of you in the room and all of our many colleagues around the country so that this becomes a location that people will go to for resources. Um, and, and we want them to be resources that they can trust, that they feel that, that um, people have, have put the energy into to um, ensure that they're appropriate and valid for for our context. So when you open up, um, I guess um, I encourage you to surf around and learn a little bit more about what's on here. But there are a couple of things I wanted to show you. You can see that we're highlighting that we're a One Health um, group. There's all our Twitter feeds, which Cass actively contributes to all of the time. Um, you can click on the, the About Us and see some um, information about who we all are. And I guess I really, um, our PhDs are updating about their work on the re, um, our research tab, um, so you can learn about many of the people who you're seeing talking later on today and the work that they're doing and, and contact them if you've got um, things you want to talk to them about. And the resources I think is where a lot of you are probably going to um, find um, a lot of useful information. So this is something that we're building with time. But if you click on the resources and go down to education, you can see all those terrific infographics and download them and we're hopeful some people might want to use them for Antibiotic Awareness Week, for example. Um, and we're going to keep putting lots of interesting things up there for you. And down here are the clinical care packages. So this is where you're going to see, they're not up yet, but hopefully soon will be, um, information like the how to interpret a urine sample um, document that, that we've um, designed specifically for many of the care attendants in aged care homes, for example. So it's, it's nice plain language um, information that is, is specific to the context of an aged care setting or surgical prophylaxis tools, so digesting some of the guidelines into really clear posters and lanyards that you can be downloading and using in your um, hospital. So I think, is there anything else you want me to show, Rod, from that point of view? Or, uh, I'll just encourage you to, to surf it and um, keep checking on it because we're going to be putting new things up um, in the couple, next couple of months. Um, but I might otherwise stop there and I think the intention is to open up for a couple of questions um, from any of the speakers from this morning's um, talks. It's been a pretty packed morning. Um, but I want to do some time questions actually. Yeah, I'm going to a bit. Um, obviously, in the hospital space and kind of race ahead and got the structure and accreditation and this sort of stuff. And, um, and we're at the start of the journey, I guess, to work with the vets and um, the livestock group as well. And, and we're very fortunate to have Mark Shoot in the audience who can check vet today. So I'll be bring up this. And Mark, from what you've heard today, you know, the next day, one of them you first started when you did the, well, the very first started at AMS in 2008. So I think we've come with Chris Bagley, who was the chief executive of Fish at the time, he said, what should we do? I said, well, maybe we should have some wedding and goes, oh, yeah, we like wedding parties. We love it, it's not going to get costly. <laughs> and so that went on to growing from strength to strength, and that's how we got the first look at the invitation. And that took a few years, but I guess I was wondering whether it's a similar sort of process that needs to happen in the world. 
uh, probably yes. Um, and, but uh, I think the, the work that uh, we've been able to do in Australia across the, the human and animal sector that has been uh, quite outstanding. The, the launch of, of the uh, national strategy last year and the launch of the implementation plan uh, tomorrow uh, really reflects the strong cooperation that there has been between the animal and uh, veterinary sectors and, and that, that largely does come down to the risks in inviting as a veterinary uh, uh, stakeholders in, into that uh, discussion. But uh, I agree with you that uh, more work needs to be done in the animal sector and uh, it's been very uh, enlightening and pleasing to, to see the presentations this morning and I'm looking forward to uh, presentations this afternoon from um, the active research in the area of uh, veterinary prescribing and what more can be done there. Um, Fred, you were saying about. Yeah, of course. Those from the audience, just interested in whether live representation be from the farmers and MPS nutritionists, they're traditionally felt that they're going to be left out. So I put a lot of some of the pediatricians on the spot, very good. us the area. I think it's interesting for me to be here because if you feel like you're a group that's not serviced by stewardship, I think we need to know that that's what we're doing. Thank you. I would like to congratulate Hannes um, and everybody else in the team for just a very impressive um, result. Uh, this, I mean, I'm absolutely blown away by it. So, well done. We'd love to be part of it. Um, and I think the work we drew in the agency in particular is just, it's really, really impressive. So, congratulations. It's actually incredibly terrifying, really. <laughs> um, just an update on the action. Um, so we had Trump with 24 electoral votes and Clinton on three. <laughs> Thank you. 